All right, everyone, uh, we're ready. Um, let's start off with the meeting for um, the next meeting on the 23rd, um, November 23rd. I know I'm not gonna be there. So should we just, um, is everyone comfortable canceling? Yeah, okay. Um, we don't need to do a voice vote for that, do we, uh, Aaron? No. Excellent. <clears throat> Well, that was easy. That was a good start here. Um, no comments from Jen. So here I am, Fletcher Clark. I'll be chairing the uh, Conservation Commission today. And my comments are just stick with us and we'll get you all through. Dave, you got any uh, comments you want to um, give us, fill us in on? Um, nothing, nothing too extensive. I know you've got a, a, a full agenda, but um, a couple of quick things. Um, we did complete the culvert removal out at Plumbrook Pond. This is something that the commission uh, permitted many, many months ago. I can't recall whether we covered this. I mean, the work has really just happened in the last two weeks or so, right, Aaron? So um, we hired a company out of Bel uh, Belchertown to remove the crushed culverts uh, south of the Plumbrook Pond. Uh, they replaced it with a very simple bridge. I think it works really nice on the loop trail around the pond. Uh, we've seen a lot of people using it over the last two weeks. I will say that with the warm weather and the work on the uh, bridge, we have um, we've picked up some of nature's engineers have been very interested in the area oh, around nice. the new bridge. And so with the warm temperatures, the beavers in Plumbrook Pond have just really complicated our lives a little bit. Uh, so they are they are very active. Um, more active than they ever have been before. So we're struggling with that a little bit. I think uh, Aaron will talk to you about a, an emergency cert um, later um, for breaching some of the new dams that they've started there along the uh, one of the tributary, tributaries, the inflow streams of the Plumbrook Pond. Um, what else? Just related, um, we did we did, or we are saying bye to one of our planners in the planning department. Ben Brager uh, is, a, is a wonderful young professional in our office, and he is moving on to work with MassDOT. Ben has been hugely helpful on a lot of conservation-related projects, including Hickory Ridge um, and others. So uh, we will be hiring a new planner. Uh, so if you know anyone uh, out there, uh, I don't... It might have been posted already on the town websites, but direct people to the town website, and uh, we're, we're, we'll be accepting applications soon for a, a planner position, um, who also uh, helps us out in, in conservation as well. Um, and then lastly, um, I think Michelle will be joining the CPAC, right, for the, the first meeting of proposals uh, tomorrow night. Tomorrow night is housing. Right. Um, I put in a very simple, um, not very extensive, I must say, proposal uh, to the CPAC for uh, kind of standard bridges, ADA, ADA uh, access, parking, kiosks, things like that. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned to you before, but I actually put it in this time under recreation. Um, I've never done that before. And I'm not sure if I mentioned to the commission that by putting it under recreation, um, if the CPAC actually funds all or part of the proposal that I put in. Um, we can use those funds on any land in the town of Amherst, not just land purchased with CPA dollars. So this is kind of a little, I wouldn't call it a loophole, but it's it's a, a nuance of the, of the CPA legislation. And that legislation, I believe, changed in 2012 to allow towns to, uh, um, I guess it's under, Kind of enhance, improve uh, trails, etc. So um, it's seen as passive recreation, uh, hiking, running, things like that on trails. So um, we'll see. We'll discuss it with the CPAC. Uh, I think I might have mentioned previously that the CPAC has about $1.8 million available to them, and they have $8 million roughly in proposals. Um, so uh, the CPAC, Michelle and the CPAC have their work cut out for them over the next couple of months. But it's going to so, be going to be interesting. So, Dave, so that's a different because when I was on this is just from when I was on <clears throat> before, you couldn't apply for trail work on under land without. That's under conservation. 
Mm. But, but right, under so just, recreation, we just put it under recreation yeah. that changes the game. Yeah. If you well, do it under really conservation, great. if you do it under conservation, which we've done it before, um, you can you can if funded uh, you can use those funds, but you can only use them on CPA related right. uh, CPA purchased property. That's how the legislation reads. So we can't use CPA dollars on Mount Pollux, Amethyst Brook, Puffer's Pond, and the list goes on and on because those were all acquired before we had the C, uh, CPA in town. Um, so it limits. Could you dredge Puffer's Pond under conservation? Couldn't do it under conservation. Might be able to do it under recreation. That's what I meant. Sorry, I meant recreation. Yeah, might be able to do it under recreation. So uh, it's a little bit of a, mm. a, a branch on the tree, uh, oh. the CPA tree. So, but anyway, a lot of proposals, a lot of good proposals, historic preservation, affordable housing. Um, so, so we'll see. You know, the CPAC is a great group. They have very spirited, very uh, detailed uh, conversations. So, should be should be good. I think I present. I can't remember. Sometime in December, I believe. So, so that's well, all. Thanks, Michelle, for um, hopping on that. It yeah. is um, important, and um, it's nice that we're all working together on. Well, it's nice that you're on that. Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a fun group. It's a fun committee, and as I said before, when Michelle was considering it, is you know one of the few committees where you can kind of make some pretty big recommendations to the council on, you know, well over a million dollars in in spending. So, really great projects. But tough, tough choices to be made this year, for sure. You said you have 1.8 available this year? Is that just, wow. Roughly, yes. Property taxes, I'll tell you. Anything else, Dave? Great, thanks. <clears throat> um, I'll just briefly brush in. I actually have been in contact with Brad and Tyler a little bit. They're interested in some possible um, habitat work across uh, town properties. And we had to reschedule a, a, meet, um, a time to meet, just to chit chat about some certain things and try to get some, so I've been kind of um, touching base with them in a little bit. We haven't really got anywhere, but just let you guys know. And... Yeah, they, they mentioned that to me, Fletcher. And I think at the last uh, meeting, which I can't remember whether you were at or not, but I, um, I, wasn't. I believe, there's some relation to the conversations you've been having and um, uh, a course at UMass interested in doing some, just some kind of modeling, if you will, what 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 could be done out on, on Amherst Conservation Lands with regard to management. I think what I've told Brad and, and, and Tyler, and I'll, I'll say to the commission here is, you know, definitely interested in, you know, I know there's some grant funding out there. I think what I told Brad and Tyler is that you know, right now we, we, you know, the commission working with staff has decided to create this subcommittee to look at land management. So I think mm -hmm. funneling some of these discussions, you know, broadly through that committee makes a lot of, a lot of sense. We're coming up on winter, you know, we're not doing anything dramatically new or different. You know, we've got plenty of stuff on our work, on our work list, but I think over the next couple of months, this subcommittee is really going to dive in on Okay, what are what are our current practices? Um, what are some things we want to do in the future? What are some things that maybe we we discontinue? You know, as we look at at uh, early successional habitat, as we look at forestry practices on town land, as we look at you know everything uh, in terms of of, of land management. So um, I think it's a good time to be having those conversations. But I, I want to kind of channel things, funnel things. Uh, at least through that committee and, and look at uh, decisions, you know, moving forward. So I think, I think it's, it's a good time to be looking at that, but I wanted them to know because they don't have as much contact with the commission as Aaron and I do with, with all of you. So I just didn't want them to kind of get their hopes up too high to say, Hey, we're going to do X, Y, or Z, <laughs> Eastman Brook or, you know, Houston Gage or wherever without realizing, well, we actually have a subcommittee with staff and, and we, I'd like to invite them into some of those meetings where we talk about um, where we wanna go with land management. So does that make sense to everybody? So thanks. Great, thanks ma'am. Uh, we'll move on to um, our agenda item at 710, land management issues, land use policy feedback. Um, Jen's got your name on it, but maybe we should um, maybe put this aside and 
bring it up for the next meeting. I think you know, just, I have I have the land use management yeah. plan. I'm the last review. Aaron sent it to me on maybe Wednesday, um, so oh, I'll get too. get it back to her like end of next week. <laughs> yeah, no, Thanksgiving, please. please. Yeah. <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. Um, and then, so Dave, you just alluded to the late was the, you just talked about the land use planning subcommittee. Is that what you were just referring to the land, or did you mm -hmm. say land management subcommittee? Sorry, I, I, oh, it wasn't the last meeting. So I think the document that was just referenced yeah. is really kind of codifying, bringing together everything we kind of currently do from dog policy to agricultural licenses to things and Aaron and, and others have done a tremendous job at pulling that all together in one place because it's been this place on the website. This is from 1986, this is from 2006, bringing that all together and kind of saying, okay, what are, what are, what are some of the, you know, the, the current practices, the current uh, policies, the current uh, regulations we have and I think that will kind of provide a good uh, a springboard for this group to, to, to look and say, okay, um, how do we wanna manage some of these areas? Do we wanna change some of these policies and, and uh, you know, policies and, and, and practices out there on the, on the land? So I think Jen was gonna look at that document, get comments, and then I was gonna take one last look at it. And that would, that now includes the entire commission, Aaron, myself, and then we'll we'll dive into that, dig into that deeper December, January. Um, okay. And that subcommittee is essentially just the remind me who it, who it is. I know it's Michelle, and who else volunteered? Uh, Alex, I can't remember. I did too. Okay, and Cameron. Yep. Oh, okay, so it's a subcommittee within uh, the Conservation Commission. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Fletcher, that that's that, that wasn't clear just because you you missed a couple meetings and we had talked about it it's basically to right. look at the conservation land and our our management <laughs> of conservation land to come up with you know for example like mowing schedules and or like if we're going to abandon mowing on certain properties right. properties to focus in on for ag use um dog issues all different kinds of you know issues related to land where we might want to re-examine specifics related to each property gotcha Great. And I think we needed to formalize that in this meeting, right? Because we mm -hmm. have the all um, the commission members. So we just need to do whatever, vote or nominate the members. Do like a voice vote, like want to do like a nomination of Yeah, like I nominate Michelle to be a member of the commission. Are you can for me or she want me to say that. No, I just <laughs> I just nominated her. I think we need to like nominate and second and then vote people into the into the subcommittee but that is if these people want to be nominated You're doing that right so, now okay. sure. i nominate cameron to be on the subcommittee are we voting on each person i i second that cameron should be on the subcommittee so how many people so can i just um <laughs> if, i think it would make more sense if we do one motion and say um <laughs> The nominees for to serve as on the subcommittee would be Michelle Labby, Alex Hoare, and um, Cameron McCooch, and that um, the the committee would um, begin in January 2023, meet um, twice oh. weekly, or I'm sorry, um, twice monthly, sure. and report <laughs> back to the Conservation that. Commission um, as we're going through the process of developing sort of holistic land management plans. Yeah, that sounds good. So um, I'll make a motion. No, I'm the chair. I probably shouldn't make a motion. Well, does somebody like to make a motion to yeah. nominate um, Michelle, I'll, Alex, and Cameron? I'll yeah. make a motion to nominate Michelle, Alex, and Cameron. I'll second that. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, voice vote. Andre? Aye. Laura? Aye. Jen? Just give a thumbs up. Yeah. Uh, Aye. Michelle? Aye. Alex? Aye. Cameron. Aye. And I for Fletcher. Great. Thanks, guys. Well, I have, um, a, I have a question. Sorry, go ahead. Um, committee, any idea what the expected product is?
Yeah, I think we should talk about that a little bit more. I think it's going to be sort of like holistic land management planning for all of the properties. And so the actual um, tangible product that we're producing, I think, is to be determined what format that'll be in. Maybe mm -hmm. like a tabular format or like a matrix of some sort um, where we identify what land management is happening on which properties and when. Um, but yeah, I think we need to sort of dig into it um, to determine what the best formatting is for the deliverables of the committee. Yeah, I would just add, I think Aaron's spot on on that. And, and I think to some degree, that's going to be up to that subcommittee to propose something back to the full commission. I will say that a couple of years ago, before Aaron joined us and before the pandemic, um, we did we did come up with a template for land management plans. We need, you know, we can certainly blow the dust off those. Um, we made some progress. I think this goes back to, um, oh my goodness, yeah, probably three, three and a half years ago. Um, and, you know, uh, Stephanie Ciccarello, Brad and Tyler, uh, some of the planning staff, Beth Wilson, um, you know, who preceded Aaron as wetlands administrator, all contributed to those. And they started with some, you know, they started with Mount Pollux and, you know, they, you know, we can, we can, we can uh, pull those out for the committee and share those and, and decide, is that a good format? Is that a good template? Um, but yeah, we, we did make some progress and they included things like, you know, the history of the acquisition, the purpose of the acquisition, um, rare and endangered species on, you know, uh, habitat on the, on the parcel, uh, current land management practices, you know, goals and objectives for public access, uh, for passive recreation, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, there's, and, and we're not reinventing the wheel, lots of land trusts and state agencies and, and other others have, you know, wonderful templates that we could use or, or pluck from, borrow from, um, as Aaron said, whether it's a matrix, you know, part of a matrix, um, et cetera. So, yeah. I, I think that's yet to be determined, Alex, but um, I think it's it's going to be an exciting project. Um, Maybe Michelle will bring it up at the first meeting. And I have, uh, I, I'll, I'll ask, I think I know the answer, but uh, I assume that the committee can meet offline. So a public meeting. Yeah, I mean, I like for our subcommittee of our um, bylaw regulations, everything was posted as a public meeting. We held, um, we held, you know, webinar meetings just as the CONCOM does. We had minutes just as the CONCOM does. Um, I felt like the inclusive public process, you know, people, people watched, people came in and asked questions. It was, you know, it was nice to have that format. And I think, um, really from a you know I think from a open meeting standpoint we would have to do it that way just because we have three members of the of the board on the committee yeah it's it's a little more work but I do agree with Aaron I think it's really good in particular particularly because of the subject matter I think there'll be a lot of people interested you know mm -hmm. um you know Mount Pollux is a great example every all of us go maybe go to Mount Pollux with and look at it with a different lens and, and there'll be, you know, many, many people who say, well, why did the commission make the decision that you want to go in this direction with management or, you know, abandoning that field and no, no longer mowing it? Well, that's been my big backyard for the last 30 years and I bought my house there and, um, you know, et cetera. And the list goes on. I mean, I, I've, I've heard a lot of things from a lot of people through the years about our management and um, or, or lack of management in some areas. So. I think it'd be good to have them as as public meetings. It's a little, uh, you know, to be posted. Some some sometimes it'll just be staff and and if, and three commissioners. Other times we we will get people interested. Um, so it's a little more work, but I think it's worth it. I will we say, Alex, that we got a lot we got a lot of discussion. It was a very focused hour of meeting, um, you know, comparatively. So I'm not worried about it um, affecting our productivity or anything. So we can't meet face to face. Oh, that well, I mean, I was hoping to do it sort of during lunch, um, lunch hour, and you know, if I have to commute somewhere, that's half an hour. Um, but maybe we can discuss that 
Okay. I would also put it out there as I have in the past that I think this committee is going to need to visit some of these areas. I think there, there's going to need to be site visits. So, you know, we may put together a, 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 a foundation, a, a, a format, whatever in the winter months and make some progress. But I think we're going to need to get out on the land and walk and talk. Um, so I think there's the opportunity for some face-to-face -face come better weather or doing it on nice days in the winter. You can't quite see all the vegetation and things like that, but I think there's work to be done in the field to really see these areas, understand, you know, why they were purchased, how, how, how close they are to adjacent neighborhoods or schools or trails or, or whatnot. So I think, I think it could be really fun to get out there and, and learn about the history of these, these acquisitions and, and what's happening. And we so might even... Yeah, we might even invite people who live, you know, for some of these areas, invite people who live and and use them to to meet us out there and 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 learn from them uh, what they know about the uh, you know say Mount Pollux or Amethyst Brook or whatever. So, Dave, um, first of all, Michelle, you'll send out a doodle or something like that to figure out what what dates and times you want to have it during lunch. That's fine, but you'll canvas to figure out what dates work. I think probably Aaron will, right? Will Aaron do that? Yeah, I mean, we we January. did what we did before was um, we did Fridays at noon. Um, that worked out really well for my schedule, for Michelle's schedule. Let me know if that will work for you guys. And I think we did the first and third or something, the first and third um, uh, Friday lunch hour. Um, and we just met, we met strictly from, um, noon to one and, and just for our zoom meetings, that's what we did. Oh, well, if it's scheduled that far in advance, that's terrific. Mm -hmm. Right. Dave, do you, so we had commissioners on it. Dave, you're going to be on the subcommittee? Well, I won't necessarily, I don't, I don't think so. Aaron and I, our role is to kind of support you, bring the staff perspective, bring some of the history. I I'm very interested in this. I think it's been something that um, is long overdue, and I think the the number of questions and the honestly the number of conflicts we have been having and will continue to have on conservation land is only increasing with more use, and we found that during the pandemic. So I think residents and abutters and users, uh, visitors to Amherst have questions about, you know, what can, what can they do on conservation land? Um, you know, from, you know, the dog walking challenges we all face, but, you know, what can abutters do? I mean, we have fascinating questions that I can share with the, you know, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the subcommittee about, you know, well, those trees are getting too tall. Can I, can, can you cut them down because they're ruining my view shed of the conservation land? Those are very, you know, things like that come up all the time. Can I use this area for horseback riding? Can I compost my, my manure on the conservation land because I don't have enough room on my property? And the list goes on and on. List so, goes on. You guys are in for it. Aaron, you got something? Well, um, I just wanted to say that Michelle and I spent a great deal of time um, preparing some um, mitigation information to present to you guys. Um, and we're coming up on the first hearing time. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just hoping that we would have a little bit of a time window to present that to everybody before we that open the like first hearing, because it um, applies to multiple hearings tonight. And now, is that something that Michelle you want to do? Or is that Aaron, you want to present that? Um, I think Michelle is going to be doing the presentation. Okay. But I'll be here to support um, with backup as she needs it. Good. Um, how much time do I have? What should I shoot for? I got Is 10 minutes reasonable. No. Five. Five. Okay. Five to seven. I'll try and do <laughs> it in five. No more to seven. I can click around quick enough. Okay. Um, I'm going to need to share my screen. You should be able to, Michelle. Okay. Okay. I can't see what you're seeing. Is it showing? Okay. Yep, you got you're, it. You're seeing, okay. All right. Um, 
I didn't want to rely on um, just myself to get all this information across uh, clearly and accurately. So I'm just going to put it on the screen for everybody to read at their leisure or very quickly in five minutes. So this is just a brief presentation of in lieu fee cost structure scenarios um, based on mostly regional um, research that we did onto like programs. And the purpose of this is to explore some options for Amherst, uh, especially as we may see more and more of this coming to the commission. Um, so very brief presentation here into it. So the basics of an in lieu fee program, and that's the acronym that you're gonna see throughout this presentation. So it's a compensation alternative to a permitting responsible compensatory, <laughs> compensatory mitigation for impacts to protected resources. So the subject here is wetlands. Um, so it's a monetary payment in lieu of providing on-site mitigation. The funds for an ILF go into a pool, which allows uh, larger projects to be funded, um, generally with the hope of a greater likelihood of success. So not very small on-site um, you know, mitigation, but maybe bigger projects. Like I think maybe Plum Brook got ILF P funding. Um, so there's the program sponsor, the permitting grantor, which is generally an agency, um, a regional conservation organization that is the is the agency or the entity that determines the cost, collects the funds, and then assumes responsibility for actually making that mitigation happen. And then there's a the compliance and reporting. So it's just the basics of any in lieu fee program. Um, so here are some in New England, most of the New England states, if not all of them have one. And this is from 2016. This is somewhat outdated, but you can see the town of Orono actually has a, a citywide vernal pool um, in lieu fee. It's actually more of a real estate transactional program, but um, that was the only municipal one I found in the region. So some you know, key as principles and assumptions here, obviously, this is a, the last course of action after avoidance and minim minimization. That's pretty fundamental. Um, the, there's a legal authority. Um, in this case, it's our wetland bylaws. And very importantly, when considering the rest of this material, the ILF is a transfer of the full cost burden and responsibility of mitigation to a different entity. So in this case, us. So that's, that's pretty key to consider that it should be considered what the in-house costs and responsibility will be to the person that accepts an ILF. So here, again, please look at this closely because these are the key cost components of a in lieu fee. So the mitigation site, so the re real estate, the real estate acquisition and all the costs associated with that, the cost of the planning, design, permitting and construction, the cost of monitoring and maintaining the project until the performance standards have been met. So we use three years generally. Four is the separate cost of long-term monitoring that's highlighted and I'll get to why, but um, I think that's gonna be a little outside our scope tonight, but it basically is perpetual or long-term monitoring past the performance period. So annual site visits, general maintenance in perpetuity. Um, administrative overhead costs, basic budget stuff and a contingency amount. Um, those are pretty, pretty core costs. So this is, this makes up the key components of the in lieu fee. Oh, that's funny. Okay. I um, wonder if this works. So here's one. I didn't realize it effects. Sorry. <laughs> the first one that I'm just going to cover real quick is the Mass DFG Army Corps of Engineer ILFP rate. So the Army Corps issues permits and has designated Mass DFG as the uh, project sponsor. So the ASCOE issues the permit and the funds go into a program um, overseen by Mass DFG and they have an entire program that um, accepts the fees and uh, does the mitigation. Uh, project specific cost calculation. I'll just show we um, did a mock up of that one and I'll get to that with some Excel spreadsheets. And then number three is that blue highlighted one. So this is project specific cost calculation, but including long-term management. This one's different. And again, maybe outside the scope of tonight, but this includes perpetual um, long-term monitoring. So it includes, um, it necessarily has a non-wasting endowment to fund that annual monitoring and management cost. Scenario one, this is the mass DFG. They have a per square foot and linear foot cost. 
So this is from 2016. Aaron was in contact with a program administrator and they're actively revisiting this. Um, I think there was a sense that maybe they needed to because um, they are responsible for actually making this mitigation happen on the ground at certain mitigation ratios. And I think they're revisiting their assumptions about what this cost should be. So it's broken into four service areas. The costs are, are determined based on that slide six of the key core criteria. Um, also the challenges of doing the restoration and some development pressure considerations go into that. So these are the core fees, but the fees are negotiable as in Army Corps can put temporary project costs, um, impact costs in addition to these and DFG can um, institute greater fees if it's a more complex or costly restoration mitigation enhancement project. So that's scenario one, it's just a number by the square foot by the acre. Project or scenario two, this is the project specific cost calculation, um, co creation and compliance only. So, um, you know, in, you know, in my speak, this is called the initial and capital phase. This is the creation. It's generally a three year period while an endowment gears up and um, builds enough to support annual monitoring but it includes all the restoration, the, the initial monitoring compliance period, and it's generally for like a three-year period. Yep, so actual project budget, is, it's a line item budget. Um, and it's very carefully thought out because all of those costs have to be done by somebody. Um, and you don't wanna shortchange yourself because money doesn't grow in wetlands. Um, so, the mock, the example that I'm going to present later is consistent with the state ILFP cost inclusions that I um, presented, except that they, this scenario does not include any long term management. So scenario three, um, same thing, except this includes perpetual management costs for periodic site visit. And this could be as very basic as one site visit a year, pick up some trash, um, pull some invasives and you're done for the year. It could be, you know, depending on permit requirements um, much more involved like spring herbicides and maintaining certain amounts of um, sensitive species populations or something like that. So those are the three scenarios of oh, process. Okay, so um, this scenario three, you know, you have to determine an annual management cost, which I just discussed. And then there's an establishment of a non-wasting endowment to fund the perpetual management. So I'm not sure I think this is just, I'm throwing it out there because this is pretty standard for a permitting, any kind of permitting entity that has permit requirements and accepts funds and puts it into some real estate um, like fee property management, just so that it gets beyond benign neglect and you can ensure that the property maintains its, um, its resource values in perpetuity with its original intention. Um, yeah, it's a little more complicated. I don't know if the town has something set up like this, but it's something maybe to keep in mind if the town is considering growing conservation lands and having funding to um, adequately manage them, especially with our land use goals. Okay, um, so any questions? Probably don't have time for questions about this basic stuff. So I'm gonna just show the cost. Okay, so here scenario one, um, that's just per acreage. So this is what it looks like for- We can't see your screen, yeah, Michelle. We, don't. Oops, we see questions. Okay, see an Excel spreadsheet? Yes. Okay. Um, so category, task, unit, number of units is just very basic. I guess what I just want to point out is that um, it's line by line items that um, are required to be done if you're going to create any BVW or wetland. So um, it's just being very specific and finding actual quotes, actual numbers, and then how many years you're going to do it, three years of monitoring, don't forget your mileage, et cetera. Then you put a contingency on it, you put an administrative cost on it. I'm not sure what the towns is and you get a total. So that's just what this looks like. And this is what I would call the initial capital period, but this is basically the creation period. 
it has no long-term monitoring, um, monitoring. And I didn't include things here like supervisor meetings, sales tech, actually putting a CR restriction on the land, um, things like that. So this is very, very basic. Here's scenario three. I didn't include the initial capital phase because I just didn't have time, but this is what it would look like if you had just the most basic annual management um, at you know just a few hours of, this is very a budget of $150 a year. This is what an endowment would look like at a 3.5% capitalization rate. So, you know, just throwing it out there as um, a scenario for the town ever. Okay, so that is um, the very basic overview of in lieu fee calculations and three structures to consider. Um, Aaron, do you want to so. add anything about, I don't know, you talked yeah. about it. So, I mean, Michelle and I, um, I, I talked with a um, person who administers the program um, through Division of Fisheries and Wildlife. And um, I think that just based on the information that I could gather, sort of the first scenario that Michelle explained, where it's like a line item by line item um, uh, estimate would be the most effective for us and also sort of capture all of the costs that are associated with this um particularly because the town like so for example um if we get x number of dollars like let's say a one acre restoration um if we just were to throw together an estimate and not include all of those factors when it comes time to actually implementing it it ends up costing the town quite a bit more money to do it um, in time resources and additional funding so that i think is the truest picture of what the fees would cost um, for us to actually take on the replication or restoration project and we have tonight a project already sort of queued up, which we'll be talking about later, but we used that one as an example um, for that first scenario. So um, I would be hopeful that the commission would consider using that scenario as we begin, because like, as we discussed mm -hmm. Canton Avenue, we did the best we could to put together um, something to kind of patch something together to include in the permit process but um, it wasn't a great precedent we didn't include a lot of the costs that would have been associated with us actually replicating what they're doing and so i feel like this is pr would provide a truer cost of what um the cost would be to the town i just want to add that um you know as a land management agency which i work for and do these budgets like Per acre costs have not been used in, you know, since the 90s because it became very clear very fast that every project is different and has different, you know, considerations, plants, complications, um, everything. And so that the like, project specific budgets are really the way to go um, in determining like an, an in lieu comparable mitigation, but also an actuality of implementation. So I, I just jump in, Fletcher. I know we're short on time tonight. Um, I have lots of questions because this is kind of the first time I'm seeing this. Um, and sure. tonight, might, tonight might not be the right night to go into great detail. Um, so I, I guess I would just look to Michelle and Aaron to kind of say, where do you, where do, where would you like this to go? I know there's something you want to consider related to a you know, a, a permit, uh, an application before the commission tonight, but I guess I, you know, I've I've got a whole kind of list of questions going on on what I've seen so far. So wh where do you want this to go relative to tonight? Because well, so think, discussion. Yeah, I mean, I think at the at the at the last meeting we we identified for at least one project we have some mitigation that needs to be done but it can't be done on site and we michelle and i were asked to sort of look into um how to calculate 
the um, mitigation fee that we would ask of the applicant. Mm -hmm. And so this is our sort of due diligence in terms of breaking down what the actual cost would be to replicate um, or mitigate the impacts of what they're proposing to do. Mm -hmm. And um, and so really that's what this is, is just us demonstrating to you at the lead up of the meeting that we've done due diligence to investigate and try to come up with a um, defensible um, rationale behind our ask for the mitigation funds. Um, can we refine this? Absolutely. And I would see this as a living document. So what we say tonight we would use, we may change and refine and improve over time um, or adjust over time. But I think we're just trying to get some more solid basic um, uh, system established. Yeah, no, and I, I totally appreciate that and, and understand that. I, I guess my question would be, so the, the you know, the, the, what you're using tonight though is not, I think my biggest concern is it doesn't, it doesn't commit us to a specific project. It is showing, it is showing an equation to arrive at a, a dollar amount for the equivalent mitigation or replication, you know, based on the research you've done. So it doesn't commit us to doing X, Y, or Z out in the field in 2023 or 24. Rather, it, it creates a number by which an applicant would need to contribute to this fund and we would then identify projects in the future. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Do you, would it be appropriate to like kind of put, put like put this on the agenda in another meeting to kind of formalize? I mean, I hate to say another subcommittee, but mm -hmm. sounds like Michelle and Aaron are on this. Yeah, because I'm also curious. I mean, I know we're just having a discussion about this. So how do we move forward with this and like it kind of accept? Um, yeah, I mean, we can talk about it process. sort of like after the hearing or hearings or during the hearings, or, you mm -hmm. know, we can talk about it at an, at an upcoming meeting. We can go into depth, more depth about it. Um, and also, like, this is all information that you guys could delve into looking at a little bit more in between the now and the next meeting, like we could upload these documents. These are literally hot off the press. <laughs> like we were working no, I mean, on this I, today, trying to finish it, yeah. like at the last minute. No, I, you know, I, I think this is really exciting to kind of standardize what we've been doing. And, you know, Aaron has been very effective through the last couple of years you know, essentially negotiating, I'm thinking of Eversource and, and other applicants, but there's been no real standardization or comparison to what other entities are doing out there. Um, so I, I think it's really exciting to look at at um, the, the, the information you've put together. And yeah, I, I would love to go a little more in depth for sure. Um, All right. Um... I think we should move on, but um, great job. Um, but we do have to figure out a way how to implement and kind of just sure up the process that you guys put in place and see that, make sure everybody's comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But it probably sounds like we're gonna talk about it in a couple hearings here. So um, thanks for all your work on that. That's great. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank Michelle, because I was out sick almost all of last week. Well, just <laughs> doing the basics of what I could do. And so she, she did the lion's share, but um, <laughs> tried to support her in that. Fletcher, it looks like Alex has his hand up. You know what, Alex, you do. I couldn't see it through your, uh, you got the pine board in the back. I didn't see the yellow on the uh, stain. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Go ahead, Alex. You got so, like, you have 30 seconds. I, I heard that, uh, Michelle's gonna or Aaron's gonna post it or Michelle's gonna send it out to all members or something like that so we could look at it in between now and the next time it's on the agenda. Yes. Yeah. Okay. You'll just put that in SharePoint. Yeah, we can yeah. upload it to the yeah. to the OneDrive for everybody to to view before the next meeting. Excellent. Um <laughs> Before we move on, we just want everybody to understand our general procedure of fairness for all applicants. Um, we try to do these for 20 minutes, but we're already over time. But 
we were going to try to stick with these um, with the uh, process that we have. Five minutes of presentation from the applicant representative, five minutes of comments from the staff, five minutes of public comment. The pop comment that has each public member has two minutes. I will cut you off at two minutes um, for comment, and then we have five minute, more minutes for the commissioners. The commissioner commissions. <laughs> Commissioner's commission. Wow. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. I'm just trying to read like a PowerPoint. And you know, maybe I shouldn't do that because nobody likes to just read from a PowerPoint. Um, but we caught we, we, wow. we caught we got you. Um, Thank you. Um, and for oh. all applicants, remember to bring up send all your stuff in before um all planning revisions by Friday prior to our meeting at noon. Um Friday before noon. How's that? Yes. And we'll start at the 1220 Belchertown Road, notice of intent. Um, Aaron, so we're ready to open the hearing? We are. All right, I'm gonna read, now I'm gonna read from my paper here. Uh, so this is notice of intent. This public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40 of the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protection of the wetlands as most recently amended in article 3.31 wetlands protection under the town of Amherst bylaws, general bylaws. Okay, we have um, the representative for this um, app, this application with us. You're muted, Aaron. Yeah, um, I think it's Ryan and I just promoted him. If there's anybody else on the call who wants to be a presenter, just uh, raise your hand and we'll add you in. Excellent. Ryan, you're already sharing. It looks like you've done this before. Yep. Hello, everyone. Ryan Nelson from R. Levesque Associates, uh, representing the applicant service net for this project. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this site, 20 Belcher Town Road. This was formerly a restaurant that is now vacant. Um, zoom into the overview of the site here. Um, there's multiple buildings on site. However, we're just concerned with portion of the property called unit one and that would be the very most southern corner um, where the restaurant building formerly was there's an existing paved parking lot on site so this is this red kind of dotted hatched area as well as these striping areas the applicant would like to repave the parking lot uh, the stormwater structures which consist of catch basins and subsurface piping would remain in place um, if anything maybe they would just shim and shore the, the grates on those uh, structures to make sure everything drains, but uh, essentially repaving the parking lot in place and then also adding some walkways and handicap accessible ramps to proposed entryways of this building. These are going to be uh, transitional housing uh, apartment units. There's going to be a total of 12. So you can see we're extending the sidewalk um, at the very east end of the parking lot, constructing concrete steps or wooden steps and stairs to each of these dwelling units, these little triangles are the entryways, um, as well as building a, a ramp for handicap accessibility at this end of the building. Um, we have a stream that is located on the property. There's a stormwater easement from the town that goes through the property and discharges to a head wall here, and then the stream uh, continues off site. So a portion of the work is located within the buffer zone. 100 foot buffer zone is this dashed line right here. Um, so we have about um, 8,130 square feet of repaving or, or limit of work, I should say, within the buffer zone. And approximately 336 square feet new impervious related to these uh, concrete walkways to the units. There is a small section of the building Right here, this is a, a former entryway porch area that's gonna be demoed. So that was taken into account for that calculation. We had a site visit this morning. My boss, Rob Levesque attended, uh, as, as well as Aaron and perhaps some others. Um, <clears throat> they had note, or, uh, noticed some potential mitigation measures that could be taken along this brook headwall area. Um, there's some debris and trash, as well as some old fencing that we are proposing to remove as part of this project. There's some large trees that would likely be damaging this head wall. So those trees are going to be cut flush to grade adjacent to the head wall. Um, there's some 
kind of not I wouldn't say erosive, but some bare slopes that could be more vegetated along the uh, headwall in this stream. So those slopes would be repaired, loam would be applied, seeded with a native seed mix, and then erosion control blanketing applied. And we're also proposing some shrubs um, to provide cover and stabilization and shade around that headwall. And those we are showing uh, consist of alternate leaf dogwood and service berry. Um, so just to recap, the only new impervious is these uh, concrete walkways and the limits of, re of repaving um, are within the boundaries of the existing parking lot. So that's about the, the gist of it. Happy to answer any questions from the commission. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Aaron, do you have, you wanna share anything, uh, photos? Yes, and I apologize. I didn't get a chance to fully download these um, before the end of the day today. So um, I'm gonna have to kind of click through them to share them with you. Um, so bear with me. Um, so this is um, standing uh, with the building behind me facing down toward the Faring Brook. Uh, this is another view uh, looking over and it's difficult to see here, but there are um, a number of um, culvert um, out, outlet discharges um, that come into the fairing in this location. There was also um, a sump pump discharge immediately behind the um, head wall closest to the building side, which um, is definitely causing erosion. Um, and it was actually discharging water while we were standing there. So, um, you know, that is another issue that needs to be addressed to relocate that and properly armor that, um, make sure that the source of that is clean water and, um, address that so it's not creating an erosion issue and not damaging the head wall. Um, there's also quite a bit of dumping that's we've documented on the site. Um, this appeared to be grass clippings probably from the landscaping company that does grass um, trimming either on this site or a neighboring site uh, just like dump behind the fence. <clears throat> Um, so this is looking closer to the headwall side and you can see there is um, another small headwall or a, another small culvert outlet um, here, which is actually, we believe, the um, outfall for the stormwater structure in the parking lot. Uh, Aaron, so, so for the last um, culvert outflows were just um, further down on that same bank that we're looking at now. Exactly. So if I just okay. turned and left the sump, and straight ahead, the, yeah. there's a there's a gas station there. It's they're like coming out from the area behind sort of the gas station location. And that's also where the sump pump drainage was. Or uh, that's nope, on that's on the, the opposite wall. side. So this is the oh, old Michael's Billiards excellent. building, and, and it's coming out of the old Michael's Billiards building. Gotcha. That was a good spot. And then, so this is actually, you can see some some erosion happening here behind the headwall. The sump pump was just up, up gradient mm. of this. So you could kind of see, I mean, I'm not saying the sump pump's 100% responsible for this, but it's definitely not helping matters. This is a view of the sort of full culvert out, outlet. Um, just another view. You can see the trees. There's there's trees, very, very large trees resting on this head wall, which is not good. Um, the removal of these trees, I would say, is very important because the, the root systems, not only are they, the, these trees resting on it, so putting a ton of weight onto that that is damaging it, the root systems are also growing into the concrete and causing cracks. So the sooner we could get those trees removed and um, 
I would say put in appropriate low growing vegetation around that that's not going to be damaging it um, and also stabilizing those corners where we're already getting seeing erosion that's going to be really important. Um, so the site visit was today, um, <coughs> excuse me, and we just got the revisions this afternoon. Um, I haven't really, you know, had too big of a chance to review them. Um, I will say from my perspective, and actually I, I do want to just add, I don't think we have a DEP file number on this yet, but correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but I think it's a relatively simple project. And I think that for a small, what is it, 336 square feet of impervious surface, the commission would be getting um, some potential significant mitigation around the Faring Brook, which I think is really important. So those are my comments. Thanks, sure. Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. I do just want to clarify, we do have a mass DP number, um, 0890709. Did you get that today? Um, <clears throat> I don't, I'd have to go back and look and see when it was issued, but I'm looking up on the EEA portal right now. Okay. It may have been late last week, Fletcher, and I was out sick, so I'm still sort of catching up a little bit. Copy. Uh, there were no no comments in that letter issued. No DEP comments. Okay, thanks. Um, before the commissioners, before we talk, um, is there any comments from the public? Um, raise your hand and we'll let you um, speak again, two minutes that pertain to our jurisdiction over this um, application. Fletcher, do you want me to let people in? If you see any hands raised, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm I sorry, is that my, I don't see, I, I don't see any hands. Okay, Maybe I see a Tom I'm... Miranda. Um, I think he might be associated with the project. control that, that'd be great. I just promoted him to panelist, so hopefully he pops in. There you go, Tom. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, just Tom quickly. Miranda, uh, yep, go ahead. I'm, a, I'm attorney for ServiceNet. Uh, Office is at uh, 64 Gothic Street in Northampton. I have no comments at this time. I just raised my hand in the event that uh, there was a need to make a comment. Copy. All right. Thanks, Tom. You see anyone else there, um, Aaron? I no. don't. Okay. Um, so you just got the revisions, Aaron. So we haven't had time to review it. We, um, we're just learning now that we have the DP file number. So clearly we're probably gonna be continuing this, but um, commissioners, do you have any um, outstanding questions you wanna get out of the way now? Seems pretty straightforward. Um, it seems like, you know, if you get those trees out of the way, Laura? No, I was gonna say no questions, Fletcher. Okay. Um, so it looks like here, Ryan, we're going to, um, staff recommend incorporating a mitigation plan. I'm sorry, did we get a mitigation plan, Aaron? Well, so the mitigation is what we discussed today in the field, which is the, oh. um, stabilization of the slope, adding mm. of plantings and, and so forth. Um, and I don't, this is completely at the commission's discretion. If you're feeling like what they're proposing is adequate, then I don't want to stand in the way of you guys moving forward. If you do want additional time to review the revisions, then that's completely fine and at your discretion. I just wanted to make sure I said that. I don't have any particular objections to what's being proposed. Um, I, I am in favor of the improvements and the trash cleanup and everything um, around the brook. Okay. Alex, do you have a question? You're muted, Alex. Or maybe he doesn't have a question. No, I, um, I was lucky enough to attend the site visit with Aaron today. And the impact is from the stormwater being uh, deposited into the brook. 
and the brook suffers from a lot of erosion. And I was just curious, there's a large parking lot that um, where the stormwater is, is deposited into the brook. Is there any way you can calculate just what is being deposited into the brook on a, on a, from a stormwater standpoint? You mean like volume of water or like volume of sediment or? Uh, what I was trying to do is get a handle on um, what additional water is being added to that erodes the stream. And uh, that seems to be our tie to uh, asking for mitigation is a stormwater uh, deposit into the stream and also the proximity of the work to the wetland itself, to the stream itself. But I was just curious how much water actually gets deposited because you can see that the parking lot goes around the building. Hi, Alex. This is Ryan. I, I can speak to that. Uh, so we we have contributing stormwater from our on-site parking lot. There's a catch basin located right here, and there's also one located here. Those are low points of the site. But there's also a town stormwater easement which carries drainage from the road. I don't know to what extent that upgrading drainage throughout the town is. It's probably multiple properties and roadways. Um, and those discharge uh, at that head wall. There's you know, a 60 inch invert pipe, there's a 48 inch. So uh, they are substantial in size, but uh, I don't know, without really delving into town records, I, I can't give you a number as to how much volume is coming out of those. Yeah, I wasn't so much interested in, in, I was just interested in your contribution. That's all. Yeah, so our, our, our paved area is about 16,571 square feet, um, but we don't have any new area contributing to those catch basins. A good way to find, find out more about the other stormwater contribution to the fearing there is probably Beth Wilson or whomever is now running the MS4 permit um, for DPW because they probably have to sample, if not that outlet, others nearby in the fearing. Um, so that could be a question just to get at some history on kind of impairment to that particular reach of the fearing. Could be good background to know for any mitigation planning. Yeah, so with the parking lot, are there oils, there's no oil and water separation. It just goes right into the stream. So if there's oil on the parking lot or other contaminants, they just go right into the stream. That's a, that's a question. So there are catch basins, Alex, which presumably would do some um, capture of the pollutants. I don't know the age of the catch basins. I did ask today if they were functional and I was told yes. Um, I guess a good question for Ryan would be, um, is ServiceNet gonna be doing regular maintenance on those and what does the regular maintenance consist of? Like, are they vacuuming those units out regularly and sort of what's the maintenance schedule for that? Thank you. And so I guess to say that again, separate from Alex's question about the contribution of the proposed project to fearing, I just want to flag that if there's a mitigation plan that we're considering, that's um, that Ryan, you or other kind of represent, representatives of the applicant um, propose, it might be good to find out from Beth Wilson at the DPW what the MS4 permitted kind of discharges are to that section and what our understanding is of um, kind of impairment to that water body because it could be something that would be interesting to try to include in mitigation costs or propose for as mitigation for impairments on the project. And I don't yeah. know if you can answer that now. I'm just flagging it as something to look into um, for future meetings. Yep, we, we could look into that. Uh, my concern is, you know, how, how much are we really capable of doing on site? There's just a very small portion of that stream within the confines of our property line. Um, we're already proposing to, you know, clear up or clean up the banks, re <clears throat> repair the slopes, uh, revegetate things. Um, 
you know, I would say the vast majority of the flow is coming from other sites in town upgrading. So I'm not sure what more we can do to alleviate any problems. Sure. My only hesitation is you go ahead and repair, spend time and money repairing those slopes, but we don't change what's causing the slope failure. <laughs> um, right. So and I, 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 you know, I sympathize and understand those concerns, but I don't know if ServiceNet is the one responsible to, in doing that. So what will the maintenance schedule be for the catch basins, Ryan? Are there, is there going to be a regular operation and maintenance plan for cleaning those and maintaining them? Yeah, we have a, a typical, uh, we could submit uh, operation, uh, a long-term operation and maintenance agreement for stormwater systems. Typically spring and fall, they're inspected twice a year and then cleaned out if necessary. Like a vac truck would suck out the catch basins. That would be great if you could submit that. I'd definitely like to include that in the order of conditions. Okay. Thanks for the clarification, Jen. I just want to make sure the water that comes off the parking lot and is deposited into the brook is clean. Any other commissioners? Okay. Thanks for sharing that, Ryan. Sure. Um, oh, Tom, you, you got a you got a question, Tom? No, I just have a comment that the use of the property is going to be for uh, transitional housing, and mm -hmm. the individuals that will be using uh, or living there uh, are not the types of individuals that will. Um, oftentimes have motor vehicles. So the, um, uh, the use of motor vehicles on the property likely will be for um, vans to bring people to and from various appointments and things of that nature. And the, even though we have a large parking area here, we, don't, we do not anticipate that there will be um, motor vehicle, a large number of motor vehicles because most of the people that will be used living here uh, just won't, will not have the means uh, to have uh, their own personal vehicles. I just wanted to make the, the commission aware of the type of use of the property that we're, uh, the, the service that we'll be making of the premises. Uh, thanks, Tom. Go ahead, Aaron. I was just gonna say, um, Ryan, in the um, restoration plan, what was the, um proposal to do about the sump pump that's flowing um out right now like is that being relocated and also it looked like the um roof gutters were filled up and or failed um on the roof and i didn't know if the plan was to keep the roof gutters or to do sort of drip edges and if there was any plan to stabilize along the side of the building to um capture that runoff yeah uh, all right so sorry go ahead go ahead, go ahead, go ahead Fletcher. i was just going to ask aaron so you're saying the um uh, are the the drain where are the drainage of the um uh gutters going they go into the uh, um, catch basins or are they going right straight out to the bank of the brook yeah so um Anybody know that right about here there's a um a uh, roof leader that comes down and goes into a black pipe and then disappears. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we don't really know where that water discharges. It might be under the leaves there, um, or it might be going all the way down and discharging here. Not really clear. The sump pump was um, coming out, say like here, and it was discharging like right there. Um, so the water looked like it was just moving directly down by this head wall. And that was a concern of mine that it, it was, it's almost like flushing out on a regular basis and washing down right behind that head wall. Sure, Aaron. So to answer your question, uh, I did add a note to the plan to reroute that existing sump pump discharge. My thought would be to place it somewhere uh, in this area here, past the head wall to the east. 
Um, so you would just place it there and it would just discharge on the bank of the river or would you guys armor that or like oh no yeah yeah we would have a flared armor outlet okay yeah so is that added to the plan because i don't see it uh not that actual not the not the proposed outlet location no okay so that should definitely be added to the plan if you guys are going to do that um and then what's the the issue with the um roof drainage the um gutter drain that came down or is that going to be repaired or replaced or do, do we know what's happening with that uh i unless tom knows any more than, than me about that i'd have to check with the architect but i would think they would try and use what's in place now um that just needs to be cleaned out and so be it but we can look into that yeah that would be great if we could just clarify it because if I mean, if it's functioning and it's getting cleaned out, that's great, but it would be also nice to have some sort of a, a stabilized flared end where that water is discharging to. Sure. Yep. Can add that. Okay. So it sounds, Ryan, it seemed clear so far of those couple of things, the sump pump, the gutter. Um, Aaron, we're going to see a maintenance. We'd like to see a maintenance plan for the stormwater or the catch basins. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see the mitigation plan too. Where are we at with the mitigation plan? So they, this is their mitigation plan. You're kind of looking at it here. Um, yeah, the, the plant tree, list and the plant stabilization. List, tree the stabilization, obviously, well, I suppose that part, uh, rerouting the sump pump outlet would be kind of part of that. Uh, commissioners, anything else that you want to consider? I mean, the one one thing that I would just say, and I'm I, I hate to keep jumping in here, but just from my observations, what the area that they're showing mitigation. So this is the head wall and the area they're showing mitigation is is like sort of directly around the head wall, but it's hard to tell because mm -hmm. it's kind of zoomed out. But there was like a tremendous amount of erosion like in this area and in this area. I was sort of envisioning that plantings would extend down um, into that location as well. Um, is that on the property? That part is. Yeah, I think the property line goes right here. So just trying to get whatever we can. And this is this area is very badly eroded down here. Um, and yeah. this corner down here is pretty badly eroded as well. The whole stream gets pretty beat up. Yeah, the whole corridor is really eroded. So if they're going to repave the entire parking lot, correct? Yes. Yeah. And then, so, add, and then add the cement walkway. Yeah. So if you do not anticipate a lot of cars, maybe you could reduce your contribution to stormwater by not paving the entire parking lot and turning some of it back to grass or something of that sort. Is that something, um, we'll still play a little hypothetical here, Ryan, if that's, would that, is that possible with the planning board or with the amount of units and parking for the? Uh, for zoning, oh, that's the right word. Yeah, there is a planning board side of it, and also, if that was the case, you now you'd be severely limiting uh, the site for future uses if it was ever sold or converted to something else. Um, and there is also, uh, I believe, a kind of a master deed um, <clears throat> allocation of parking because this is uh, kind of shared with a, a greater condo complex so i it, i'd be hesitant to want to remove any parking spaces yeah there are buildings in the back and there are workmen back there today so i did it, it i understand now that the parking lot is shared with other buildings anyways it was just a thought um mm -hmm. so ryan what about the possibility of extending this um the mitigation further to those um Sure, that's not that's not a problem. Yep, we can do that. Um, 
maybe we could see some revisions or something on the plan that actually shows that. Aaron, do you have um, a little bit more specifics about kind of when you were drying those little polygons? Yeah, I mean, what we had discussed- How to be a little bit more specific, I guess. Yeah, what we had discussed on site was like erosion control blankets, seeding and planting um, mm -hmm. to stabilize a little bit around that head wall. Um, it's where the water, you know, it's a very flashy, similar to the Tanbrook, a very flashy, very stormwater influenced water body. And so anything that can be done to stabilize around that outlet immediately where water is going to be shooting out of that head wall uh, will go a long way to reducing erosion and also protecting this property long term um, and stabilizing that head wall so that it, um, the health of the head wall um, lasts longer. Mm -hmm. Does the head wall need to be resealed or anything once those trees are removed? You said they were creating cracks. I mean, are there going to be like frost and water damage once those cracks are opened up? Just, just thought. Resealed with concrete, you mean? I don't know what you would reseal it with, um, but I'm just picturing, you know, cracks that are not filled with or they're rotting tree roots now and possibly water is going to be getting in there and freezing and um, making it worse. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think that's a question for, for Ryan. And I, and again, mm. I think if it's a town drainage easement, that would be a town structure, but Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. Something along those lines that, that would be uh, another animal to evaluate the integrity of the culvert and, you know, sizing and how, how to replace it, or I, I, I can't speak to the condition of it. Oh, I don't think we're looking for replacement. I think Michelle's just saying, cause it, there, it is cracked in several places and she's just asking, are you going to be repairing the cracks? The concrete head walls. Yeah. I'd, I'd have to check with the town to see <clears throat> the responsibility of that. Here, Michelle, there are two culverts, and if you look at Erin's picture where she shows both culverts, where the two arches come together and uh, go to the ground, the concrete, I believe, was deteriorating. Um, we didn't take a close look at it, but I, I think Erin also noticed that the concrete was deteriorating where the two arches come together in the middle, down, down at the ground. But I... You see where our concern is here, Ryan. So just when, when you know, when uh, we're, we're going to have to continue this and get the new yep. revisions and everything. But um, something to see, I think you should really just consider is looking at, you know, when you start to specifically, you know, we're, we're all for the tree removal to maintain the integrity of the culvert. So that's something that um, I think Michelle's um, question is valid. If there's tree roots reaching in there and breaking open the culvert, which happens um, and then now if all of a sudden you pull those root systems out and let the water get in there and it freeze thaw, we're going to have issues further down the line. So um, I think that's just, if you could, you know, consider yep, that. We'll, we'll look into and, that. And just see where we're coming from with that, that we're very concerned about the integrity and that's why we're okay with you removing the vegetation off that, which, which is right on the Fearing Brook. So I think, um, yeah, just yep. keep an eye on that. and. Um, see if there's you know be uh willing to be creative on maybe if there's something once those tree uh, specifically those actually were you taking the stumps out or are you just flush cutting them i'm sorry you said no, flush cut just just flush cutting you did um so you know we'll just i think that's something we're gonna have to you know keep an eye on that specifically when you're operating in there in and around that area you're going to be seeing a lot more especially when you start doing the uh, reseeding and then, um, doing the erosion control so Fletcher, I do see that there's somebody from um, the yeah, public that okay. wants to speak. Um, I'm, I'll promote them to panelists, but I do think that we need to move this move along. On. Sure. Hey, yeah. Tom, you're all set, right? You got your hand up. I, I'm all set for now. Okay, Thank you. Take that hand down. Be great. Thanks. And we'll just take one more comment from the uh, public and uh, please keep it brief. Yeah, just and also um, just state your name and where you live, please.
You got anything? I. Oh, there you are. Hi, Pat. Okay. Yeah, my name is Pat Patnot. I'm um, the real estate agent that uh, this is my listing. I'm with the Jones Group. Yep. And I just wanted to point out because, and <clears throat> this was alluded to earlier, this um, building is unit one of a three unit commercial condominium complex with uh, corresponding exclusive use areas. And the, <clears throat> um, if you look at the plan, the condominium development plan, and you overlay that onto the site plan that's been developed by the engineer. Um, I think that he was aware of the boundary of the exclusive use that goes with this particular unit one. Um, if you start extending some of the mitigation work or the greenery to the east, northeast, that mm -hmm. was sketched out, I think maybe Aaron was sketching it in red, mm -hmm. um, you may go over the boundary into the other unit, the other ownership not under the control of unit one. Okay, yeah, so, uh, I appreciate that, Pat. That was my question as well. Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, you can finish. Yeah, the, the condominium documents are very specific on it. And the there's a common wall as the building uh, kind of goes at an angle. Um, so where that common wall ends is the end of the uh, structure that they're talking about purchasing. But it, it, there's a bend there. And I think that you just want to be careful that you're not, or I would suggest that you not try to um, require ServiceNet to do something on the abutting property. In other words, that they, yeah. you know, that that kind of all fit into the plan. So I just want to, as an observation. Thank you. Um, definitely agree. So I think obviously, Ryan, you clearly have a pretty well good knowledge of the site and the detailed plan you have here. So I think that's something you, um, we trust that you'll uh, be able to uh, to find and not cross the cross the boundary. Yep. Thank, thanks for that info, Pat. We'll keep that in mind. At the, uh, okay. So I think we've got this one down. I think we, we need to do a um, we have to have to continue this to get the revisions that we just talked about. Um, would, I'll make and, a movement to continue the hearing. Um, Aaron, what's the date we're continuing to? Hold up, hand. I have it. December 12th. Ooh. All right. Uh, movement to continue the hearing to December 12th at 7.30 PM. Second. Excellent, Andre second in. Thank you. Uh, voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Jen. Aye. Uh, Alex. Aye. Or and um, Andre second and, um, and I for Fletcher. Yeah, I for me. Yeah. All right, you guys have to do I too, even though you did the motion a second. Sorry. Um, thanks, Ryan. Does it pretty clear? Was that clear what we we're looking for? Yep. Yep. I got my list. Uh, thank you all for your time, and we'll get your advice plan soon. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. Take care. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to move on to Fearing Street, and I will. Um, I'm going to open this uh, hearing. So this public hearing is called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth, and Act relative to the protection of wetlands, as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection of the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. This is a notice of intent for 46 Fearing Street. And if there is a representative um, here, please uh, let us know. Fletcher, oh. this is the ongoing hearing that we've been um, continuing and continuing. Um, you know, I should probably remember that. Um, <laughs> no, it's been so long since we've actually continuing. talked about it. Yeah, it is um, Got continuing. It. So um, thanks, Jen. And um, since I opened everything, can I get a motion yeah. to? Um, yeah, I'll make a motion to continue the public hearing. Um, for 46 Fearing Street to December 12th at 7.35. Thanks, Laura. Seconded. Cameron of the second. All right, excellent. Um, voice vote, Jen. Sorry, aye. Voice vote, Andre. Aye. Alex. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Cameron. Aye. Laura. 
Aye. And I for Fletcher. Great job, everyone. Moving right through. Okay. All right. So we're ready to move open. Um, Five fifteen Sunderland Road. All right. I'll open this hearing. Uh, this hearing is being held. Uh, this, this public hearing is now called to order. This hearing is being held as required by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 4 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protection of wetlands as most recently amended in Article 3.31, Wetlands Protection of the Town of Amherst General Bylaws. Is there anyone here for um, Sunderland Road for this notice of attempt? Yes. Yeah. Hey, Fletcher, just so you know, this is another one that we've been talking about for the past couple of few mm -hmm. meetings. This is the battery storage. Yep. Over at 515 Sunderland Road. Okay. Just letting you know it's been open. Oh, I was trying to do this every time. Yeah, only if it's a brand new, the first time we're opening a hearing. But and you all just can't let me hurt, just read, right? read away. You just like me hear, hear oh, me read. Oh, I didn't want to interrupt. You were doing such a good job. I know. I <laughs> oh, great. It can't you didn't hurt. Your role, Fletcher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and it, right. It really hurt my feelings. I mean, you're well, making up for all the times that I've never, I forget to read it. So. Right. I'm like, I'm like holding on to this anyway. We'll break um, even. We'll break even. Right. Hey, Josh. Welcome back. Um, you mean we're back? So um, take it away. Sure. Yeah. Um, wasting no time. Um, so familiar with me. Um, unfortunately, no one from Wood can make it tonight just due to some scheduling conflicts. But um, I'll uh, pull up the plan, most current plan set, um, and share my screen uh, just to aid here. Let me know if everyone can see that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so since our last meeting or after the last meeting, the main discussion mostly centered around the secondary containment proposed on site. Um, and uh, so we took some time with Wood to look at uh, the design of that, uh, the secondary containment system and measures, uh, how we can improve it and, and per the feedback at the last meeting. We submitted those uh, updated these updated drawings to Aaron on Friday. I think we I don't know if we made it by noon, but I know we got it on Friday. So, um, but uh, so um, Aaron, of course, will wait to hear your feedback. But for the commission members, um, effectively, so the main changes uh, at our, on our previous plan set, we showed uh, basically a, a line containment trench around the perimeter of the uh, battery and storage uh, enclosures. Uh, that then kind of fed into the larger infiltration, stormwater infiltration trenches around the perimeter of the site. Um, taking into consideration the feedback at the last meeting, we've changed the design. Um, so um, what you see now is that uh, each uh, pair of enclosures uh, will have um, its own uh, line trench surrounding the enclosures. Uh, each of these uh, in trenches will have two outlet structures with um, filters. Uh, at the corner, basically the southern facing corners of each each trench. Uh, then there's going to be horizontal uh, conduit, additional conduit trenches, um, kind of you know running along all the, the rows of enclosures um, to you know carry stormwater that may enter these trenches uh, uh, through the site and then into the larger infiltration trenches uh, that were existing on the previous plan set. Um, so that's that's the main change we. Um, we felt like this was more in line with what, based on the, the commission members were uh, discussing at the last meeting, is, you know, would, would hopefully satisfy um, uh, what, what you were envisioning. Um, and I do think it's, a, it's certainly a better design. Um, so that, that was the primary change uh, from the last meeting to now. Uh, really no other aspects of the site changed. The only other change uh, really that's noted on the plan or the plan set um, we did, uh, as part of our process with the providing follow-up information to the, uh, planning department, um, for our special permit, um, we did conduct a, uh, sound study for the site, um, uh, looking at the, the sound the system produces, um, how it might affect, uh, you know, nearby residences, um, in correlation with mass DEP noise policy. So we, we had taken, we were already in the process of taking, um, ambient sound measurements on site. Um, and then following that up with the formal analysis that was wrapped up. Um, based on the analysis, we have updated our plans to show um, sound, some sound mitigation 
really the only difference is that rather than the uh, perimeter fence, the the chain links uh, perimeter fence that was uh, there previously, now there, that will need to be turned into, or rather be a, a, a sound barrier, um, uh, made an official sound barrier uh, constructed around the site um, on all sides to um, to dampen noise uh, that may make its way toward uh, the residential butter to the north and the south. Um, otherwise, it doesn't uh, affect the design of the system otherwise, um, and, you know, we'll still uh, the system as designed will still allow for stormwater to infiltrate into the trenches um, uh, and again and carry it throughout the site through the the um, horizontal call it conduit trenches. Um, so I will stop there uh, to just uh, open any questions. Um, thanks, Josh. Lord, you have something you want to say right away? I don't know if you want to let Aaron go first and then I can wait. Yeah, if it's okay. Is that all right? Yeah. Here, take it away, Erin. Yeah, so I, I did take a look at the plan set today. Um, I, there was two comments that I had. The first was the culvert replay, repair replacement at the driveway because that was an issue that was raised at the last meeting that the culvert is failed on one end. And I know um, they were going to look into, um, because it's partially within the mass DOT right of way, um, repairing or replacing that culvert. So that's question number one because I don't see it incorporated here, but I also may have missed it because I was didn't have a ton of time. The other question <clears throat> or comment I have relative to the proposed containment system is, I guess, twofold. Um, I would expect to see sort of a, a solid concrete pad underneath this system. And I'm I guess sort of confused as to why the, um, this the, all these trenches and things are being installed as opposed to just doing a concrete pad and doing that because I feel like that provides sort of more of a true containment um, situation there. Um, the I guess the lined containment trench number one i wonder what is it lined with so that's one question and then the lined containment trenches are being directed to infiltration trenches so i just want to make it clear to the board if something was to happen there was a lightning strike or some kind of damage to these structures and there's let's say 1600 gallons of toxic material leaching out of it it's going to go into a lined infiltration trench then into a uh, i'm sorry a lined trench and then into an infiltration trench which is designed to infiltrate water into the ground so to me it's kind of counterintuitive i guess the plan and i'm i guess a little bit confused about why the um, containment trenches are being directed to infiltration trenches um, and I guess, is the commission comfortable with that? And um, and also the question about lining, what is it? And why not just do a concrete pad? Sure. Um, wait, hold on real quick, Josh, before that. Um, yeah, let me, let Laura, I think, I'm gonna let Laura go in yeah, and then we'll just do a couple my, more things. We'll just get it to a nice big list. <laughs> I think my comments are um, similar to what Aaron said. So obviously standard in the industry. I wasn't sure, Aaron, if we had directed them to not use concrete pads, but that's that's standard practice. So, um, and then I'm wondering, because I, I definitely am not comfortable with um, drainage and infiltration. Um, I actually, I mean, I think the point of containment is just that containment. So I actually wonder if, you know, there's two approaches here. Um, if we can't do a concrete pad without some sort of lip um, in the event that there was ever any, you know, any issues with the battery itself. Um, and then, and, and I don't know if that's possible, Josh, but then, uh, you know, I don't know, this is kind of a question for Dave, I think, um, or Jen uh, or Aaron, but, um, you know, in, in situations like these where, it, there's some trepidation about um, allowing a project to go forward. I mean, I think, I think 
battery storage is primarily safe, but in the event of any sort of fire or something like that, you'd have to spray a chemical onto the battery. Um, and the concern is that obviously it's in a resource area. Um, or I, I sort of fast forward to like the decommissioning of the battery system. Um, and, you know, like if there was a leaky battery, for example, yes, you want a containment, but you also want it removed. So I'm, I'm wondering, Josh, do you guys, do we ever do bonds? Can we, can we, can we do a bond here um, for the cost of decommissioning um, the battery or a leaky battery or, you know, like something to that effect? Those are my comments. Okay, thanks, Laura. Um, anyone else from the um, commission? Well, I kind of skipped over the public part, but um, since we're going, we'll just stick with it. If anyone has some. I guess I'm just curious. Um, so Laura is saying the concrete pad is standard and possibly I could see a lip being standard. Like what? what is protocol for a leaky battery with rainwater? Like what, what is the emergency response? Is it like a suctioning up of a lot of hazardous wastewater or I'm just curious. Yeah, I, Michelle, I don't think there has been, like I'm actually not aware of a leaky battery. You know what I mean? I just think like if we're, if we're talking the long-term here and if these batteries are designed for, you know, 10, 20 years, just to be safe, it's nice to have something underneath it to catch it. But I think the battery would have to be, I, I don't actually know what protocol is because I haven't experienced it yet. Yeah, I guess I'm just curious as to what emergency protocols are, and what the general assumption is for the containment under those circumstances. Okay. Um, other commissioners before I get to Dave? Um, yeah, I have, um, more of a comment, but I'll go ahead, Dave. Yeah, no, I was just going to jump in and and maybe, you know, defer to Josh on on his conversations with the uh, the zoning board of appeals. But to Laura's point or questions about decommissioning bonds, typically the the ZBA, you know, addresses that. I'm not I'm not familiar. I guess I've not had that experience with the Conservation Commission requiring bonds, but perhaps Josh can speak to that with regard to where he is with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Again, recognizing that battery storage, this is our first uh, full, you know, uh, 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 first battery storage project, you know, not associated with, with solar panels in town. So. But Josh, do you, you know, have you had those conversations with the ZBA? I'm not sure exactly where you are in that process. Uh, just hold off one second, Josh, thank you. Um, anyone else? I'm just gonna get the list out. Yeah, and my, and then I'm just gonna add in my understanding of why there wasn't concrete pet. Well, I'll wait, oh, sorry. Um, I'll wait for actually once the discussion going. Aaron, do you have something you want to say? I just wanted to say that the commission has held bonds and that we can hold bonds. Okay. Just putting that out there that we can. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. So um um Josh, you I think you had it's pretty straightforward there. So why are we why are we having um infiltration or you know filter conduits going into the inf infiltration areas? Why not concrete pads? Um, I'm assuming concrete pads around the in, uh, why are the batteries sitting on top of concrete? Is that what we're asking? Because I remember there was a whole yeah because we didn't because the we we're trying to get away from mitigation from that. But um, mm -hmm. I think Josh could probably get into the details about about um, why you guys chose not to do that. And am I missing anything else? So we're worried about containment and where is it going to go? Yeah. Um... No, those are all great questions. So happy to tackle them in turn. So um, I'll start with the secondary containment. So um, uh, Fletcher, to your point, you're correct. Yeah. So originally we had proposed that one foundation design to do is kind of these concrete piers rather than a slab underneath all the enclosures. Um, I will uh, confirm. I will confirm with Wood uh, just because they're on the call, and I just want to confirm that it was used in the updated stormwater calculations. But based on the last hearing. Um, and the comments received with secondary uh, containment, 
all the enclosures are now located or on, so they are being modeled with a full concrete slab underneath the containers. Mm -hmm. And then the, the impermeable trench lines the, the slab. Um, so so there, there is a impermeable surface underneath the containers uh, and then the trench to the side. Um, in terms of the design, again, I'll, I will confirm that, um, but I'm almost positive that's the case. Um, in terms of why we were trying to do this design with the trench, uh, as opposed to say a concrete bath the lip, um, uh, primarily just, well, A, it's a design that um, I've seen used or proposed on another energy storage project in Massachusetts. Um, and I uh, thought, it, you know, it was, it was a good design. Uh, I definitely agree with the comments that, you know, the most standard basic form of secondary containment would be uh, just a lip on a concrete pad. Um, so typically the reason we went with this as opposed to just say a concrete pad with the lip was you still, you know, typically, I, I, you know, as far as I'm aware, even with, um, uh, basically there still needs to be some way or most of the time secondary containment is designed such that there's still some way for water that is in the, basically like once the, the lift pad fills up with water, you wanna be able to drain that water somehow or have it removed from the pad because if it sits there, you know, it could cause issues with the concrete, cause cracks over time, et cetera. So typically they'll, you know, the secondary containment system will have some kind of um, additional equipment or system uh, that or design to allow water to uh, eventually make its way out of the pad. So that could be a, a, like a sump pump system that has a filter in it. So in this case, the intent was to um, water would go or you know any runoff of any kind would go into that trench. And then again, at, at the corner of each of the, imper the impervious line trenches would be um, a filter placed to treat the any any runoff or water and catch anything that would go in before it then goes into the the additional trench that um would then carry water to the larger than infiltration trenches so the idea would be that there would be filters installed at those outlet structures such that they would catch material or prevent material from you know filtering the water out or filtering the material out of the water so that that water can then go um, exit the system from a stormwater perspective um, you know, I think we could, you know, certainly like we could pivot, I would say to, instead of just a line trench, we could do a, um, uh, a, uh, a lift pad that with the same kind of idea that, you know, there's some, some, some kind of uh, alloy structure with some kind of filter or, or treatment system of some kind. Um, that's, that would be, be kind of the, the other way to do it. Um, I, I think both effectively are accomplishing the same thing, but typically you can, again, you can do a, a lift pad with no, Outlet, it's just that, um, from my understanding, there could be just more maintenance involved. You just might have to, like, after rain events, you'd have to come oh, potentially nice. clear out the the lip pads of the water um, just to make sure there's not build up there. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, or just addressing Aaron, your quick point on the culvert, I, yeah, I actually, I, we don't have the details shown here. Um, so, you know, we've obviously discussed it, and, and we have followed up with. Um, uh mass dot so you know there would be an access they would likely require an access permit for the work in in the the easement drainage easement but uh don't anticipate that being an issue so we are um we are fine you know we're, we're totally on board with that being a condition of the approval um that we have to make those improvements um and you know uh to the to the drainage features in that that easement um and if if i know um if if there's a desire to see maybe details Either it could be a condition where we provide those details for those improvements, you know, as part of our process with DOT and get the permit there, or you know, we if we need to do it now, we can we can work with uh, Wood to provide those details. Um, on the uh, decommissioning bond, so or where we're at with the ZBA, so we submitted an initial application at beginning of August to the planning department. Um, it took a while to get comments back, just so I think they're pretty backed up with applications. Uh, so we did, it took a couple months to get, um, feedback from planning, but we, we got that, um, earlier in October. Um, it, they had a bunch of follow-up items, uh, that they wanted to see addressed, um, primarily additional just information submittals, which we just re, uh, just at the beginning of this week, um, submitted, uh, as a, you know, follow-up materials. Um, 
they didn't actually specifically address a decommissioning bond in the comments, but Blue Wave is part of all of our projects do propose um, or and would propose the ZBA that we would have a, a decommissioning bond put into place. Um, you know, we obviously want to give that comfort to the town and the, the landowner as well, uh, that they're not going to be left with a project that they can't remove. So, um, you know, likely what we would work to do with the ZBA would be to submit uh, prior to construction, um, you know, based on the, the final approved design, uh, decommissioning an estimate for the cost to decommission the system. Uh, and in that bond, of course, you know, we'd look to so set that initial amount, renew every year and escalate uh, the bond amount by some percentage every year to account for uh, general inflation. Um, uh, so, so we would, we certainly would look to address that and have it be callable by both the town and, and the, the property owner. Um, in terms of, you know, that bond being used, um, I believe Laura, you, you raised the, the point on, can it be used for like, like uh, or maybe what's the general procedure or process if something happens during the operation of the project. Um, obviously during the operation of the project, <clears throat> the town wouldn't need to call the bond because Blue Wave as owner operator would have to spend money to, to do the cleanup or any necessary procedures if, or when responding to an emergency event. Um, so the bond wouldn't be called in that instance, but Blue Wave would be you know expending funds uh, necessary for cleanup. Um, and when I say cleanup, um, Again, you know, as has been mentioned, I think, Laura, you were saying this, um, you know, it is expected that these batteries, the way the, the lithium bat ion battery cells actually function, um, yes, there is some manner of liquid electrolyte in the battery cells. It's mostly absorbed into the anode. Um, so there isn't actually, real, in reality, in, in the operation of the system, there's not that much free state fluid. Um, all the individual battery cells are hermetically sealed. Um, you know, it, if you're talking about some kind of large amount of potential electrolyte that would come out of the system, um, you'd be talking about um, like some kind of meat, catastrophic event, like a, uh, something like crushed a large amount of the, the enclosures or, or battery cells all at once. Um, and then of course, you know, you're, there's a lot of things to worry about in that situation. Um, but um, yeah, so that's, <clears throat> and then what the procedure would be though, if, so basically the, the cells and the enclosures are monitored 24 seven um, for temperature, voltage, current, um, there's atmospheric, so gas detectors in the containers as well. But basically if they're, so if a battery were to be leaking, so, and, and really, again, the only way it would leak is if some kind of physical action caused this, the cell to rupture, um, more or less we remotely, being remotely monitored, we would know if there was an issue with any individual battery cell or any of the, the enclosures. So we would respond to the site. If there happened to be some kind of rupture, just like contained within the enclosure, um, then obviously the system would be de-energized de um, and uh, handled by technicians to, to remove any damaged battery cells, um, you know, do a root cause analysis and figure out uh, what happened and replace them if needed. But obviously the system would be shut down during that time. So. Um, and we have submitted a, a draft emergency response plan to as part of the process with the ZBA, um, but that would be those, you know, those kind of procedures and process would be detailed uh, there as well. Uh, Laura, you have one more thing? You got something else you want to do? Yeah, I just, you know, I, I think the bond for decommissioning is okay. I just, you know, I, I, I agree that there's, it's a real outside risk um, that, something would happen to, you know, cause a rupture in the batteries. Um, at the same time though, like, I'm not sure how it works um, because our bonding would be something, I, I actually would be interested in knowing historically what we've done because, you know, I would imagine that legally, let's say, say let's say a tree fell in the battery. I don't know if there's trees in the site, but, or, or like, you know, there's a fire or something happens and we want it removed like immediately. Um, a bond would allow us to avoid that legal process and just basically pay to get it removed. Um, so Aaron, I don't know, you know, perhaps this needs to be another um, discussion, but, and then I guess my other comment is we don't have to talk about it tonight, but if there are in fact infiltration, um, you know, devices, I'm really curious to know sort of the O&M plan for that. You know, like how often someone's gonna change them, is it, I certainly don't want it to be like install it and be done. Um, so I'd be curious about that. 
before Erin. Yeah, um, just piggybacking on Laura's comment, um, and uh, I know Josh had mentioned, you know, obviously with a concrete pad, you need some form of drainage. Um, I would say something similar to like what you would see in a parking lot, like an oil water separator, a actual structure that would capture the material and contain it so that it wouldn't be discharged or at least um, hopefully it would contain it to a maximum extent so it wouldn't be discharged and infiltrated into the ground and then that structure could be cleaned out hopefully preventing um, toxic material from getting into the ground or the groundwater um, I was also to comment you know per Laura's comment I know that he mentioned that there are filters um, I was curious about how frequently those filters are replaced and also what is the capacity of those filters so if you have a battery or two batteries that leach 1600 gallons of liquid that's toxic, are those filters going to actually capture all of that material? It seems unlikely a small filter is going to do anything there. Um, and then the other thing was for the culvert replacement, we would definitely need some sort of spec for a plan on that because we can't just condition it and say, oh yeah, replace it with you know whatever you come up with. We'll definitely need to know is it an in-kind replacement? Are you increasing the size? And I would definitely encourage you to increase the size, especially because the current culvert obviously um, didn't really function well. It's very, very small. Um, Are you saying yeah. culvert on both sides of the driveway, each entrance or just one? Yeah. Well, the, there's, a, there's one culvert that goes from one end of the driveway to the north all the way yep. to the outlet to the south and yes it is partially functioning but the outlet on the south is is failed so, so you're, you're specifically talking about the south one well it's Crushed. all one culvert the, okay the, the culvert goes it starts here so you're talking replacement of the whole thing okay and it goes and it comes out here i mean it's a straight line obviously yep. don't mind my scribble but it in inlets here and outlets here so it's like Got one it. big culvert that goes through um and you know if it ends up being that the culvert's in great shape and you're just repairing the tail end of it that's fine but um our preference would be to increase it so it can handle the velocity of the water coming through there um okay so we you hear that josh culvert yeah. issues so we i don't think we've gotten anywhere with the um the infiltration um idea in terms of commissioners being comfortable with it i mean you just said you guys want to hear plans you know is there a maintenance plan with these uh, um can you just jog my memory a little bit on this you never the first proposal you're putting these bet you were going to put these batteries on piers and therefore you weren't going to count those that area in there as impervious surface is that right correct but now you're saying we're going to put them on concrete pads and so you've had your new revisions now calculate that as the impervious certain so that'll be additional impervious surface correct yeah and, and and originally we did have also that the access road was kind of dual functioning as an infiltration trench, which was pointed out as, mm -hmm. as a concern. So um, that's where we added basically this additional, you know, uh, additional infiltration trenches on the, excuse me, on the perimeter of the site, mm -hmm. especially this uh, southern edge here. You can see that the size of the infiltration trench does increase kind of along the southern boundary as well to account for that increased stormwater flow. So that, yeah, that is, that is correct. That's the okay. That's the revision we see. Yeah. Um, Aaron, did you, I did I see a couple people from the public raising their hands? I didn't see anybody from the public raise their hand on this. Let's just let's give the public uh, opportunity here um, to comment um, about the our jurisdiction over this um, application. Um, please uh, state your name, where you're at, and um, please keep it to two minutes. Um, got somebody, Lipinski. Yes. All set. 
Yeah, we hear yes. you. Okay, uh, Mike Lipinski, uh, 167 Shootsbury Road, Amherst. Um, it's, I think it's encouraging to hear that the developer is, is moving to concrete pads underneath the batteries. And I'm not sure it's, if it's within the ZBA or within the Conservation Committee, but I think one of the issues here is it's a tremendously crowded uh, proposal that you have here. You, right now it has 51 concrete pads in a relatively small area. It's hard for me to see at home because I don't even have a sense of the scale here. I'm just going by the size of the driveway. But if you look at the way it's laid out, there's almost no space between these units, which makes you wonder how would they be serviced? How would they be taken care of in an emergency if there was a fire? It doesn't look like it's big enough to, dr to drive anything through them. And I think that part of the drainage problem might be solved by having a project that isn't nearly as dense and that that's leading to some of the issues here. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Okay. That's the, that's the question for all of them. Um, I think, uh, Josh, you did point out last time that that, that, that it, you can access in between, they're serviceable with, they're 12 feet? No, it's not 12. What's the? Yeah, so the- uh, We did talk about this uh, last time. Yeah, so there is, um, yeah, so there is, so the space in between the enclosure, so there's doors on the, the long side of each enclosure. So the space in between the enclosures allows for the doors to fully open. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's uh, on the short side, it's five feet and on the long side, it's, uh, I believe it's 12 feet. So, um, so that's on the, the rows of containers. Um, right. So that's, and I, that's, again, we typically, so any site we're, we're gonna start with, that's the manufacturer uh, recommendation for space, our minimum requirement for spacing. We start with um, for servicing and maintenance. Um, and in terms of interior access, obviously, so there'd be gain and, and for servicing, um, you know, you'd be able, you would drive in here. I'll zoom out, sorry. Um, uh, you know, service trucks, et cetera, would drive in here and be able to walk through the system for access. Um, and then, you know, in an emergency response situation, uh, you know, emergency response vehicles would pull into the existing driveway, could it also pull into the, the proposed access road. Um, you know, there wouldn't actually be a desire to put pull in vehicles closer than that. Um, you know, in the event of a fire, it is recommended for first responders to keep their distance from, say, if there's a specific enclosure uh, that, you know, has a fire concern, um, then you would want to maintain a specific distance from that. So um, I believe typically is recommended, it's, you know, approximately 75 feet, uh, sep you know, um, safety perimeter, if you will, from any affected enclosure. So, um, you know, you'd want to, uh, to make, you know, really there's no need or I guess overall, we need for uh, emergency responders to get closer than that. Okay, thanks, Josh. Aaron, I just wanted to say I don't, you know, the drive access isn't really a con con concern per se, like in in terms of right layout and understand it. But um, well, what we could though, how are people feeling though with the current layout here with this infiltration system or you know the trenching? going into the infiltration system. I know we just, I feel like I'm repeating myself again, but are there, what other options would there be for containment um, that we would be, feel comfortable about yeah. working within this resource area? Um, I'm not a battery containment yeah. expert here. So, yeah. I, um, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say, I said another way, commissioners, I think we're kind of at the point where we need to give the applicant some concrete feedback. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Laura. So one of the things that I would be interested in, Josh, you have an, an engineering team. What would they suggest to address our requests? And rather than mocking something up in its entirety, um, I'm actually really curious. So I think concrete pads are um, uh, like a really good move here. You know, I think that was like my, one of my biggest concerns. Um, but is there something else that you guys have done elsewhere that we're not seeing here? Sure. So, um, you know, we, I certainly could 
could circle back with Wood to see what other designs are seen. Obviously, with regard to applications for energy storage, um, there hasn't been really, uh, I'd say, many systems I've seen installed across the country, examples of systems, there really hasn't ever been secondary containment um, proposed on sites typically. So um, in terms of specific to energy storage applications are limited. I can certainly fall up with what obviously there's other types of developments that have secondary containment um, for various reasons, whether it be like a gas station, or, you know, other types of developments that might have uh, spill concerns. So um, yeah, we, we can we can take another look and see if there's anything else. Uh, I don't want to throw anything off the top of my head because it would be probably just, um, you know, me just trying to brainstorm live, but um, but certainly I think to what Aaron mentioned, you know, there the oil oil uh, oil water separators is another. There's kind of like I mentioned, kind of these like sun sun pump devices uh, that can be used or have been used in the past, depending on the site and what you actually are trying to contain. So um, I think boiling it down, it sounds like what the commission's looking for is just a very clear, concrete, no pun intended, uh, way for everything to be contained and there to be some device, whether it be the filter, and if it's a filter, what are the specifications of that filter, uh, Terrence point on load and, and replacement. But if there's another device that could be used um, that uh, just, you know, is very clear on its, its function, um, that would say, you know, again, I, th I think that was the intent, certainly of the filters. And, but we'll, we'll, we'll circle back up with wood uh, and can provide, you know, I guess call it final clarity on what we do think the, the best solution is here is. Um, I do want to, I think one clarity that'd be helpful is, you know, um, again, this kind of lined trench and Aaron, I know you asked on what, what it is lined with. It's obviously a, or not obviously, excuse me. It's a, it, an impervious uh, membrane um, that would be used to line the bottom. So it wouldn't be, con we wouldn't propose concrete. It would be a, a membrane. Um, so if it's, I guess what would be helpful is if the commission, you know, if we can, you know, give greater clarity on this solution with the trench, or if you'd like to see concrete pad with lip and then figure out the same kind of like drainage, you know, treatment uh, uh, concern as well with, with that solution. I've effectively from a stormwater perspective, they're really, I guess, you know, you could just imagine instead of there being an impervious trench, you just are expanding the concrete pad slightly and adding a lip. It's more, you know, from a stormwater perspective, it would be the same. Um, so we're kind of, you know, coming to the same, you know, uh, solution either way. Hmm. And a culvert. Don't forget about the culvert. Sorry, and a, yeah, and the culvert. Which, yeah, then, and what maybe could be helpful is we can circle the wood, um, and then um, through, through the end of this week and. And obviously early next, and then Aaron, as, as your availability um, allows, just try to meet with you potentially early next week and just mm -hmm. go over what we come up with, some ideas, and if you know, what, and just talk with you, and if and if you want to share the feedback or what you know what we're able to relay, um, both on the culvert and the containment, um, I think that could be the the next steps. Aaron, are you okay with that? Yeah, definitely. I just want to make sure Josh is aware our our next meeting, which is was scheduled for the day before Thanksgiving, um, is canceled. But our our meeting next meeting would be December fourteenth, I believe. Um, so that gives plenty of time for us to meet and discuss and go over whatever your um, adjustments are. And I'm happy to accommodate meeting with you and having a look at it. And I, you know, I think one one thing I just want to express is I'm extremely grateful that you're taking our comments into consideration and trying to come up with creative ways to address this. And so thank you for doing that. And um, I think this is our first battery storage system. So we just want to make sure that we're doing it responsibly and that we're protecting the resources. So we appreciate that you're adjusting the design to make us feel more comfortable with what, what you're doing. Thanks for saying that, Aaron. Yeah. Um. Alex, you, you have a question? Let's keep it. Just real quick. For those who might have missed it, we're talking about containment and other than water or discharge of water. When you come back, uh, could you tell us what what contaminants we might be containing? Just a list. I think is that provided already? I don't know. It's, it's a lithium ion battery. So it's a lithium ion battery. 
Correct. And I don't, I don't know. I believe it was part of, oh, sorry, maybe Josh can answer that. Was that already provided? I thought it um, I think, I believe it did, but the, the brief answer is um, in terms of normal operation. So there's, there's really two things. There's a bit of, well, three things on this site, I would say that are of concern to be um, uh, transformer dielectric fluid, if there, which in this case, we would propose to use a non-toxic soybean-based uh, dielectric fluid. So in actuality, I, I would argue that these, the pads up here don't really need containment because that's primarily what that containment is for is the transformer fluid. Um, the batteries themselves are lithium ion uh, based chemistry batteries. So they'll have, they will basically what you're, what the concern is, is in regard to any liquid electrolyte that's in the individual battery cells that could, um, if the battery cells were ruptured, spill and, and first in the container itself for the enclosure. And then potentially, you know, the concern is to get outside of that. And then, um, uh, uh my brain is just blank that's okay yeah i think i'm with you man um yeah we've got another hearing we, we should we've got yeah we and yeah, yeah. um alex that a lot of that stuff is in the documents Gosh, but we can you. also um talk about that later so i think we're gonna um josh was that you you just outlined yep. pretty well what we're looking for sure. um thank you um i think we're gonna make them obviously we're gonna make a motion to move um to continue the hearing our next meeting is not until december 14th but as you discuss Maybe you can start touching base with Aaron sooner than later, and you guys can start um, spitballing. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some new ideas that might be coming in front of us that make us a little bit more comfortable in terms of filtration on um, water catchment systems. Sure. I did and also add a, a battery storage folder to our OneDrive. I saw that. That was good. Like, you have some good stuff. There's a ton of research papers and stuff in there on the battery storage. So Alex, if you're interested in reading more, there's more in there on them. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Actually, Alex, that's where I read about it. It's all in yeah. the- um, Yeah, it's not in the- about the, um, what the chemicals were. It wasn't the applicants. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. That was in all your research. Thank you. Or yeah. your bibliography there. So can I get a motion to continue this meeting to um, December 14th? I'll make a motion uh, to continue this hearing to December 14th. 740. 740. Second. Second. Ooh, Andre got you. Sorry, Michelle. Uh, voice vote, Cameron. Aye. Alex. Aye. Jen. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Andre. Aye. Laura. Aye. Aye for Fletcher. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Thanks. You'll be in contact with Aaron. Sure. Thank you. Good, Good night. Through. Thanks. Okay. Containment. All right. So we're going to move on to the next um, hearing at 47 Olympia Drive. It is open. So I don't need to reopen. <laughs> um, and we will get uh, Alex. Um, We'll get moving with this. So the applicant, uh, can the representative for the um, 47 Olympia Drive. Mark, can you uh, say hi to us again and uh, just say um, who you are, where you're working with and where we're at. Um, hi, my name is Mark Sonicki. I work for SVE Associates. Um, and I guess I can give a quick overview again of the project. Um, let me share my screen. <laughs> So our client, Acapulago, is proposing to raise an existing fraternity house located at 47 Olympia Drive and construct a multi-story apartment complex um, that will impact the buffer of a Fingal wetland that has development on three sides. Um, the proposed... <clears throat> Stormwater system will collect the roof stormwater and run it through a um, double call tech, or not call tech, retain it. Um, if it will retain it, stormwater system out the back, um, there would be a six unit retain it system that is uh, um, here that will infiltrate will provide infiltration and the larger retainer system will just be a detention system to 
retain water to control the stormwater offflow. Um, then the stormwater are discharged to a small rain garden before discharging to the conservation land to the east. Um, water, stormwater that falls on the access alley will be collected in deep sump catch basins, ran through an oil water separator before being um, directed to another retain it, retain it infiltration system that's located within the courtyard. That retainer system discharges to the municipal system, which is actually UMass Amos system. Um, Kyle Archipelago needs to get permission from UMass to be able to um, use the system, which is also part of the planning board process, which I believe he's in discussion with them about. Um, so water that falls within the courtyard and on the sidewalks is collected in deep sump um, nyloplast strains that will provide pre-treatment before those get discharged into the um, retain it infiltration mm -hmm. system. Mark, we're like, looking at your email. I don't know if that's what your intention is. Um, no, it's not. I don't know. Oh, I was like, yeah. It's... Sorry, I, moved I thought you were like, hey, I read the municipal. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. It's okay. Let's restart. We're following you. No, no, you don't have to restart all yeah, over we're again. Following we, you. We're following, following you. We follow you. Yeah. yeah, just, guys, just, I don't know, Mark, if it's okay for a second. I think the two things kind of outstanding yeah. on this permit are a contribution to the mitigation fund, which we were all comfortable with. We just needed mm -hmm. to come to some details on that after the last meeting. And the second thing was permission from UMass for the connection to the storm, the sewer system stormwater system. Um, so it sounds like Mark addressed that Kyle's chasing that down. He also needs it for the plant for the planning board. Um, so I think really the outstanding thing we needed to discuss here was the how we come up with a the amount of the contribution and the amount of the contribution to the mitigation fund. Correct. This, this is a reminder. 67% um, alteration to the BBW. So, so actually the permanent... Twenty percent permanent um, alteration. The remainder. Are you guys seeing the same screen? Do you guys see a landscaping plan now? Yes. yes. The remaining disturbance gets mitigated by natural pollinator. Oh, by native pollinator plants and native trees within the riverfront. Um, or not riverfront, but the wetland setback or buffer zone. Sorry, it's late and. Um. As you can see on the landscaping plan, all native plants will be um, planted and seeded along the eastern side of the proposed building and down the slope. So um, those impacts, or well, the majority of the impacts um, are just temporary and they'll be mitigated by reseeding and replanting of native plants. So the only permanent would be this section of the building here. Um, which is 28% of the wetland buffer zone on the property. Which is what was discussed last meeting. Right. So I'm just going to jump in here. I know it's late and everyone's tired. Um, Run it. So we, Michelle and I met and and Mark, I don't know if you were on at the beginning of the meeting, but we did talk about sort of like our strategy because this is a new a new process in terms of our alteration limitations in the buffer zone that we have currently under our bylaw regulations. So we're trying to establish sort of a standard that we would hold hold all applicants to, and that's what we are discussing on the on the front end. Um, Michelle, would you be able to pull up the table um, that was sort of formulated and see? Um, I'm not sure. Mark, was your and in, in Michelle while while Michelle's pulling that up, Mark, um, because the outstanding approval from UMass was your intention that we continue again tonight in order to allow additional time for that. I think if I believe, well, is um, Anna? Do you see Kyle on? I don't. I, um, I wish he was on to speak to that. Um, I believe it's part of the planning board requirement, or it would be part of the planning board requirement. Um, and if that's the case, then that connection needs to be made for Kyle to get a permit anyways. Mm -hmm. um, 
if you be viewed Jason's letter, Jason believes that the stormwater system will work. It's just um, whether or not Kyle can get the permission to do it. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, I think you guys have have addressed my issues with the stormwater system pretty extensively and and everything now is is over 80 percent tss removal for the for the stormwater system so um <clears throat> okay so are you suggesting that we would condition the permit to require um umass uh approval prior to the project starting or something to that along those lines or would you rather that we wait to get the permission before we close the hearing so that if you need to make adjustments to the stormwater plan, you can do that with the hearing open? Um, as I would prefer that it would be a condition, um, as that's, um, in my opinion, outside of the jurisdiction because that's going to the municipal system. Um, I know eventually it goes to probably your jurisdiction, but it's more along the lines of Jason's area of concern. Um, and if he believes that it works and it's just a situation where Kyle needs to get the okay from new mass, I think that's something that should be conditioned instead of um, continuing the meeting till December 14th. Okay, so just to make sure, because if you can't get the permission from UMass, you might need to redesign the project. And if we close the hearing, then that would eliminate that, your ability to do that. But you're comfortable with that, taking that risk? <clears throat> um, if UMass says no, then this project is pretty much in my, like, I don't really foresee a way to okay. Okay. redo the project without okay. starting from scratch again, and I don't think Kyle wants to do that. Okay, All right. fair enough. So, Michelle, can you pull up the table? I think I need him to stop Mark sharing. Mark, you're to stop so. sharing, yeah. Stop sharing. Okay, is this the table or yes. itemized budget? Yeah, the itemized budget. Um, so, Michelle, can you zoom in just a little bit? Sorry, I don't have an updated version of this because we this was like last minute <laughs> completed. How, how does this look? It's better. <laughs> so, Mark, just to run through this with you, um, and can you can we get the header? Yeah, there we go. So, Michelle ran through a presentation at the beginning of this that sort of outlines all of the assumptions and um, reasoning behind the information that we've included here but um, basically if we're um, allowing mitigation off-site then what that means that we need a piece of property to do it on um, so that's sort of the first piece and then um, plan development which you know um, might include delineation wetland delineation el elsewhere um, also like a design component then there's the materials themselves, the seed mix, the plantings that would be planted, um, uh, fees associated with the plants, um, staff time, um, fuel costs, any herbicide treatments that are required, um, compost soil issues, signage, equipment rentals, watering, um, and monitoring um, of the project. And so we, this is very, um, you know, we're doing our best to come up with something here. And this is what we came up with to try to take all of those factors into consideration. And so um, for this project, it came out to $13,107.29. That was, that's what we came up with. Um, can I add something, Erin, that um, this is based on a 7% permanent alteration, so the 20% is allowed through our bylaws, so we calculated it for 7%, and that's the area square footage used in this calculation. Are you sure about that, Michelle? About which part? Are you sure that this is only 7% calculated based on 7% of the site? 
so that was the land acquisition cost. And then the 7% of the site is 518 square feet. I mean, that was the basic numbers that okay. was given. But but the, the planting numbers, does that reflect that same square footage, 500 I mean, square feet? That's what I was asking for feedback today. So mm -hmm. this planting, I think this is a similar number of trees used by Canton. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, if somebody would like to, you know, contribute numbers, this is an, another benefit of this kind of approach is that it's very transparent and can be discussed. Yeah. What tone do you like, Aaron? Well, 500 square feet, I just, I, I thought it was based upon 27 or the full 28%. Um, and so I guess that was the one assumption that I was unclear on. And so that, and, and for the number of plantings, like for me in a 500 square foot area, uh, that number of plantings would be a little high. So I, that's why I assumed it was based on the 28% total, but, um, I'm comfortable with this and I, I'm comfortable with the number and I'm comfortable based on the different criteria that we've included here. Um, and I, I think it seems fair to me and, and well documented sort of how we arrived at this. Um, and I guess it makes me even more comfortable that there's sort of enough plantings here to accommodate potentially even more area than um but Nothing wrong um, with that. i can live update it so if you want me to change the numbers it will automatically change the totals no i just, I, I, yeah, think I think it's think, fine i think that's okay um okay well sorry alex do you have something you need to yeah in line two um i question seven percent the amount of the buffer that will be permanently altered is 28%. And so finding mitigation for 28% is founded in our regs. It does say that uh, the commission can allow alteration up to 20%, but it doesn't say without mitigation. And um, I think it's uh, squares with our regs to require mitigation for 28% or 27%, whatever the number is, and not give away 20% without mitigation. Erin? I mean, I, I do agree with Alex. Um, I guess, it really comes down to the commission's discretion. And, and I think about like, for example, a single family homeowner, you know, and, and I know like recently we had a single family project where but they, we but did the regs allow for 20%. Right. Right. So the regs say the commission may, it doesn't say will allow. It says may. And we're working on this one live. Um, yeah. So I went, I went back and, and read them and I talked to Aaron about it. We had we had a fair discussion. And, and we have this scenario here with the 7%. I just think she needs to change it to 28% or 27% or whatever the number is. And I just did. So there is a new, I just changed the square footage. So um, Where? here's the 100%. Oh, am I not? Is it frozen? It didn't, it didn't reflect it. Didn't. it. It didn't change. Yeah, if it's formulas, Michelle, they didn't update. So I was pausing, sorry. So I just want to show you, this is the um, land calculation. So here's 27%, 2,000 square feet estimated. Oop, here we go. It jumped from 13 to almost 19 grand. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Well, but no, just to be regs... clear, that doesn't mean we all agree on that. Yeah, I mean, the commission, yeah. it sounds like the commission needs to. Uh, so here's where um, I think, uh, Mark, thanks for, I think the, the applicant has definitely um, put some, um, has tried a lot to get the 
drainage that going into the conservation area has been, mm -hmm. how am I trying to say this? There's been a lot of work on the application to um, help us feel comfortable, mm -hmm. more comfortable about this project. The regs allow for 20%. Alex, you're arguing that this, there's a may in there. Um, it says may allow the alteration of up to 20% of the area. It does not say must allow alteration of 20% and that no mitigation is required for altering 20%. It's just not there. And I think the commission needs to follow its own regs. So may allow though. Yeah, that may means allow, that we yeah. may allow 20%. There's a <laughs> huge discretion. discretionary yeah, it issue there. Yeah, it's, it, it may say, and it may not. It may or may not. It may, that's, that's, it may that's, not, and it does not say without mitigation. But so it doesn't Fletcher, say with. Yeah, correct. So we could do, so I want to ask, um, so so we're trying to, are we trying to close the, the hearing tonight? Or we're just trying to agree on this first? If you if you agree on this and you're comfortable with conditioning the mm -hmm. um, UMass permission, we could close tonight. Mm -hmm. If as long as the applicant is comfortable, you know, with if we can come to an agreement on the number for the um, in lieu mm -hmm. contribution. Yeah, in lieu of, uh, contribution. So, Mark, are you sure? Uh, go ahead, Andre. Um, I think we still have a little bit of work to do on um, on agreeing on the kind of the standard uh, on what are we going to do. Uh, for it to for uh, this to be this kind of a uh, uh, mitigation to be a standard or for mm -hmm. uh, which by the way this is a really good um, uh, really good table and great way to calculate this um, if it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to uh, try and figure this out on the run while we're still while we're uh, trying to uh, reach a conclusion on uh, Olympia Drive or, uh, you know, approve or, dis or disapprove. Um, Alex is, to me, uh, this is again through, from my opinion, Alex, uh, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying that, um, you know, uh, the, uh, we're, we're looking at a, a 27, 28%, but we're only, uh, um, we're only thinking of uh, of compensating for uh, for the overage, if you would. I think we should uh, take this on this discussion on at a different time and try to agree on a way to uh, to decide yay or nay on uh, on uh, forty seven Olympia Drive. And to me, the uh, the 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 total here of 13,000 based on uh, 7%, I think is, is fair for, uh, uh, for now, as we are uh, continuing to uh, figure out a, a, a more of a standard. Um, that we So can may I propose then um, something, you know, if, if people disagree there, we can, that's why we're here. Yes and no's, that's mm -hmm. fine. Um, Aaron can do something so maybe to try to move this along and if Mark's okay with us trying to close this I'm kind of interested in trying to close this mm -hmm. um, uh, possibly if we have enough agreement tonight we close the hearing with obviously the conditions and then we close with this mitigation in lieu of mitigation discussion but this this doesn't seal a standard right this doesn't seal like okay this is what exactly what we're doing moving forward but at least we're now we right. have this document here yeah. that shows, okay, we're gonna say right now with this one only applicant right now, we're gonna say this is a 7% mitigation uh, percentage against the mitigation that we're gonna ask the applicant this one time. Is that, how do people feel about that idea? Um, yeah, I like that idea. I feel good, yep. yep. I also like that idea. Yep. Um, I will well, vote against to make the it, precedent. Yep. Say it again. I'll vote against the precedent, even if we yeah, say it's not precedent. That's fine. That's, that's fine. Problem. As long as we're that, that's that's fine. But uh, so one point I want to make, and I'm go ahead, Fletcher. I just want to no, make sure ahead. I say it before. Say is it. Andre and Fletcher have both missed two of these hearings. 
So mm -hmm. Andre and Fletcher can't vote on this. Even though I watched. Yeah. You can only watch one. You can only miss one hearing. Ooh, I watched both of them. I'm not sure. Okay. I, I did all of the math and I know That's both Alex and Cameron, we need their vote to vote on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, for I, I thought I was there at the first one of the um, meetings that um, yeah. where it was you'd, first you'd, uh, put out. I thought Andrew. <laughs> but yeah. I did miss the last two meetings. Yeah. So if you yeah, miss more than one hearing for one given project, you can't vote on it. Unfortunately, it's a Mullen rule state mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. Oh, because they were here 12. I think Laura only missed one and the other Alex and Cameron weren't appointed for the first meeting, but both of them did view the um, September 14th proceeding and told me in writing that they viewed it so they can both vote on it. This was something that I had investigated offline and I'm sorry to just be bringing it up now, but I did confer with the town clerk on it because mm -hmm. we had two new members who hadn't been in an appointed at the first hearing and we wouldn't have had a quorum without them. Um, right. But that doesn't mean that you guys can't express an opinion yeah. and it doesn't mean that you can't share what you think is reasonable. It just means that your vote yeah. can't go can't toward vote. the Yeah. Sorry I get to it. bring that and, up. And I think I think the proposal here is fair. I mean I don't think we're establishing, at least in my mind, a precedent. I think this group still needs time to digest. The detail that Michelle and Aaron put together, but I think it's also unfair to penalize this applicant with a more sort of severe interpretation of uh, of the guidelines. So, uh, so is, does someone make a motion then to make a motion? Yeah, but hand, let me make sure. <laughs> but wait, so just to clarify, yeah. so Mark understands. So what we're doing is closing closing the public hearing, and then so Aaron, don't we have? we need to issue an order of conditions in 21 days. So does that mean we need to have a special meeting to issue an order of conditions? Because so, um, so yes, yeah, so all great points. So I guess the, the first concern would be, I would wanna have Mark sort of weigh in on whether he thinks what we've come up with is fair because I wouldn't want us to issue something if he's, uh, feeling mm -hmm. that it's unfair yeah. or that you know we haven't done an adequate process on it just because then it could be appealed and you know we we want to just try to work with the applicant to you know come up with something we can be agreeable with um but the other issue is if we do close the public hearing tonight we will be over 21 days and so we would need mark to grant us permission to oh. exceed the 21 day um, threshold so that we could issue it on the 14th of december um i'm not <clears throat> i would like to see my, have my client um look at the total that is being proposed for the mitigation fee um i don't remember what he said that he was fine spending up to for the fee so i mean and he's not on tonight which i wish he was um so if the commission wants to um, continue it again, I guess, since it seems like um, either way, he's going to have to wait um, to get an order of conditions anyways. That Makes really sense. Cool. Yeah, that's reasonable. OK. Um, I think we've done our due diligence for the most part on this. Um, Can I just add something? Um, so Mark said it was 8%, so I just changed it to 8%. It's, it's not a huge difference, but um, I was just going on numbers. Thank you. Said if you want to give like a an actual square footage, that would be best, but I was just um, going with numbers. On the plans, let me share my screen again. Hopefully this works. So if we're continuing anyways, I think we've got other couple other business items we have to cover tonight and it's getting really late. So I think we should nail down the square footages. We can refine the table, um, get that number and then confer with Mark offline, make sure that the applicant's comfortable with it and then discuss it on the 14th would be my recommendation, but the board 
proceed as you see. It's a great idea. I appreciate that. So um, stand by, Mark. We're going to make a motion to uh, continue this and then just exactly what just Aaron just said. Is that, is that, is that all right with you? Uh, yeah. Okay. I think we should just say for the record, Mark, that we appreciate your um, patience with this process. The town is trying to figure out how to do this in a fair way for situations just like this one. Um, and it's come up. We kind of got several applications at the same time with this and they've, they've all been different for different reasons. So thank you for bearing with us. We're trying to be like transparent and fair about it. Um, so we appreciate your willingness to work with us. Oh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, I just wish Kyle was on so he could give his opinion about the fee and we could get this moved along. But as he's not on and I can't get in touch with him, um, I guess it's going to have to be continued. And we can. Uh, on that subject, I make a motion to uh, continue the public hearing on 47 Olympia Drive to uh, December 14th at 7.45 p.m. Second. Michelle, the second. Thanks, everyone. Uh, Alex? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. Michelle? Aye. Andre? Aye. And I for Fletcher? And I for me. I'm sorry, Cameron. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I was like, I just going to remember it because I wasn't looking and I forgot. <laughs> sorry. It's harder than it seems. Because everyone's no, I, boxes move around. Got it. All right, Mark. Um, we're going to be in contact with you. Really, Aaron will be. Um, yes. And um, I do hope you did hear what Jen said, and we do appreciate it. Um, we're not oh. trying to use you as a punching bag. Um, okay. We are just trying to do this the right way, and it's you know it, this is the process. So I really appreciate your patience. Thank you. All right. Have a good night. You too, man. You too. Bye. And also his that landscaping map he had that's actually in the Sunderland folder by Aaron. It's but in the what folder? Sunderland folder. Oh, sorry yeah, about that. Oh, look at that. I, I got really confused. <clears throat> hey guys, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna check out and go take a lot more Tylenol. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe a, thank you all some bourbon I'll, or something. Thanks, I'll Jen. Thank you for showing up. Great. Bye. All right, what do we got, Aaron? Um. Okay, so um, there's a couple things. So there's an emergency certification, which has not been issued yet. I'm going to suggest we table that discussion. Um, that will be on for the next meeting, December 14th. Um, the other thing is that the, the white paper discussion is taking place tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And I wish that I had mentioned that before Jen jumped off, but it's tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Um, the white paper discussion with the Water Supply Protection Committee. Um, and talking about incorporating staff comments and things so just to have that on your radar screen if you wish to attend um the other issue Wait, with the subcommittee but where, where the water the supply protection committee that drafted the white paper that i so sent around to you guys there look for the link where um if you go to the town of amherst water supply water protection supply, committee okay. web uh, web page well, you put there it in the packet didn't you um, I don't have a link to their meeting in there, but um, the, oh, the white paper, paper was in the meeting yeah. or was in the um, packet. So if anybody wishes to attend to see what's going on, um, I know <laughs> Dave had suggested that um, somebody attend to sort of explain the commission's standpoint. And I know the hope was that Jen would, but I don't know that she's going to be able to. Um, I'm actually not going to be able to attend either, unfortunately, but I already gave my comments on the paper. Um, but anyway, I just want to make sure that's on the commission's radar screen. And then the other thing is Simon Hilt is here from Eversource. This was like a um, very last minute request for a minor modification to, to the um, Montague Fairmont order of conditions from Eversource. It's the last business item on this agenda. Um, I told Simon I didn't think we were going to be able to do it tonight and it's really late and Simon is hung on to the call. If we do do this, Super. I would say we five minutes <laughs> max on this discussion because we really, um, you know, if the commission is feeling, it should be, yeah, it should be really straightforward. So I'm just going to promote him to a panelist and then um, the, the information is in the packets under the change. Yeah. Um, but Simon, if you could just 
do your best to keep it um, very succinct for us because we've had a really long meeting and I am, um, I think we're all, we've all um, sort of reached capacity here. Probably including Simon. Including Simon. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. You guys are all hard workers, uh, really part of the Midnight Oil here. So um, just really quickly, thank you so much for squeaking this in here. Um, I'll share my screen. Let's see, I want to share screen too. Let me know if you can see that. Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, so this is one of the uh, work pads on the uh, the Podic uh, substation tap line. So we're just a couple of structures uh, east of Route 63. Um, this this work pad for structure 14148 was originally permitted, uh, typically as we do 125 foot box here. Um, so basically, what was permitted back when we came before you originally was. Um, we got this portion of the of the work pad that's within the uh, outer outer 100 feet of the 200 foot riverfront area, and uh, in that permit we had proposed to restore this portion of the work pad. Yet we had planned to keep the access road that basically leads down to, to Eastman Brook and gets us across here. Um, so ultimately, what we're what we're looking to do as a field change here, we we typically you know. The work pads never end up being square. So this is this is what ended up getting built is this entire polygon that you're seeing here. Um, overall, uh, the, the project has had about 5,500 square feet less impacts who have been riverfront area than was permitted. Again, that's overall, not just for this pad. Um, so what we're looking to do here, if possible, is rather than restoring everything within riverfront area, we would restore what is kind of shaded out here um, top and bottom, and then this green part would be loamed and seeded. So what would be left with would be essentially a, a very small like bucket truck pad beside the structure for future maintenance activities and a contiguous access road that leads us to, you know, from what's existing here, this white dash line to what we've built and is permitted to remain here. So basically we don't lose access to the remaining structures out by the solar field. Um, so with with this proposed change, we would still be uh, a you know, grand total of about 2,200 square feet under uh, what was permitted for riverfront area impacts in town. That's it in a nutshell. Aaron, you've been out here. Was this is all you guys are pulling the mats out of there right now, right? I haven't yeah. been out to the specific site, no. Yeah, yeah. so we, we have not stockpiled from uh, other places yeah. along the, the section that we uh, have stockpiled now, and that's what they're in the process of right now is, is removing mats. And that was part of the original proposal. Is that, so this wasn't part of the original proposal to keep a, um, the permanent gravel area for the... You say yeah, for, truck or something. for whatever reason, uh, I wasn't part of the original NOI that was filed, but you can see our note here in general, we try to restore when we have work within sure. riverfront area, but because we've got several structures beyond this point here, I think there's uh, seven or so structures, six or seven structures beyond Eastman Brook uh, before we get up to the tap line, the railroad up there. Um, so the, the road was was proposed to remain, but this, this note here to remove uh, gravel and restore yeah. Basically, you know, we, we said that we were going to restore the, everything within the riverfront area. So again, we're just looking to basically keep a small area next, area of gravel next to the structure, and then keep a contiguous path through here. Um, this figure here is a little bit funny looking, but um, the black is outside of riverfront area, so it's that red gravel that's inside. And again, what we're what we're shading here would be fully restored. Shading here would be fully restored, and we'd loam and seed this area as well. Essentially, that would be restored to vegetated surface. So it'd really be just what's unshaded as far as this red hatching that would remain. It, it's um, roughly twenty three fifty square feet. To me, it kind of makes sense because you're gonna you already keep in the road, so you're gonna have a half road that goes through there anyway. It's it, so I don't know if other commissioners have issue with this speak up i mean i just I, I guess i would just want to make sure um simon you in the permit we uh, and i haven't gone through the permit so all fairness um we allowed a certain number of alteration for riverfront area and what you're saying is that if you include this you're not going to be exceeding that number correct so, so 
so so as you can see, just I'm going to flip between the two the two um, images again. So what we what we permit is a is a square, right? So what we build out in the field is typically never a square. It's how much we need to get the work done. So this this structure here was several thousand feet uh, less than was permitted. And again, overall for the entire project, because we had a few of these instances where a pad was built smaller than permitted, we have a we're net negative 5,500 square feet of riverfront impact. So even if we, even if you allow this, we'll be 2,200 square, square feet below what was permitted for town. So I, I just, and I just want to clarify that because those pads are temporary and this is a permanent fixture, this gravel. So I just want to make sure that the permanent impact, the permanent alteration is going to be balanced out somewhere else on the site. The, the, the permanent in impact for the project, we are 5,500 below. So okay. we, we th this one right here, um, yeah, is not is not the example as far as where we have we, we do have other areas where we have permitted permanent gravel that we did not basically use all of. So okay. that's that's the that's the justification here. Um, again, we we're just kind of at the point where we're winding down the project and we're looking to have the contract to wrap up the final pieces here. Um, I apologize that this kind of slipped through the cracks here. I didn't realize that there was such a push to get the contractor out of there at this point. Um, so, I mean, we, we could certainly restore this, this whole site. We will have the road leading down to the river there. Um, and, you know, if, if there is future need to, to come back through here, we could repermit construction of a road or we can, you know, say that it's kind of all coming out in the wash here. And there's no wetland impact with this gravel. It's just riverfront. Correct. Yeah, it's the outer outer 100 feet as well. Okay. I mean, I would be comfortable with it based on the statistics that Simon is outlining to me that they're under their permanent impact numbers and that this will, you know, hopefully prevent future need for a permanent alteration here um, or even temporary alteration here since they have the pad in place. <laughs> Um, but it's really up to the board at this late hour if you're comfortable approving this change to the order of conditions or not. I have no problem with it. Sorry. Feel free to make a motion. We'll see where it goes. So it would be framed as a minor administrative change to the order of conditions to allow this if they're under their alteration thresholds for the permit. Go ahead, Andre. I know you yeah, want to. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to word it. Um, I make a motion to accept the uh, minor alteration on um, the Eversource permit for the Montague Fairmont order of conditions? On the uh, Eversource permit for the uh, Montague Fairmont um, work. I second that motion. <laughs> okay, we got we got a second. All right, let's start with get some uh, eyes out of here, Cameron. Aye. Laura? Aye. Alex? Aye. Michelle? Hi. Andre. Aye. And aye for me. Excellent. Thank you all so much for squeezing this in tonight. Really appreciate it. Uh, another thanks, question thanks, before thanks. we go. Did, were, was the commission looking to do um, any site visits before we before we close things out? Um, I know we've had kind of ongoing water concerns over on Spalding Street. I actually was out there, uh, Aaron, I think I mentioned to you last week. Uh, I, I ran into Amy Gates while I was out there and she seemed to be okay with everything. And I just mentioned that we, you know, we're obligated to keep an eye on things. And if there's any issues that come up, we'll, we'll have corrective action in place. Yeah, that sounds good, Simon. Let's check in offline. I wouldn't mind having a site visit or two out just to see a couple examples, but we don't have to figure it out tonight. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you all you. very much. Good night. Thanks, man. Aaron, if there's a site visit, please let me know just so I can continue to get to know the town. Of course. Thanks. Okay, team, I think we're ready for... Right. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Who was that? Aye. <laughs>
Nice. Nice. Hi. Andre. Hi. Cameron. Hi. Laura. Hi. Michelle. Hi. Fletcher is an I. Oh, yes. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Did you guys already stop recording? Nope. That's all you. Oh, oh. Okay. Sorry. You want me to do that? <laughs>